stakeholder groups. But um, if you could, if you are the primary uh, representative of either your community college, a school district or school, if you could um, raise your hand and we will go through and ask you to just tell us who you are, uh, what school you represent or district you represent. And uh, if you could let us know um, what is of primary interest to you on today's agenda or uh, with regards to sustainability, what interests you most in that way. So with that, uh, I see we have a, a number of hands raised. I'll ask that uh, either Jessica or Katie uh, call each person out and we'll give you about a minute to introduce yourself. Sure, I'm gonna to try to grab them in the order in which hands were raised. But first up, we have Janet Dixon and you should be able to unmute yourself. Okay, I am Janet Dixon. I'm Director of Facilities with Temecula Valley Unified School District. And on the agenda today, I'm interested in EV chargers and the gender neutral restrooms. Um, we also have Kelly Kohler from Temecula Valley. I'm gonna to have to hop on and off for a couple other meetings. So uh, if I'm not speaking up, Kelly will. So uh, before we go on, I will um, notice that we are recording this. Uh, so I just wanted to acknowledge that this is being recorded and we'll, we'll be using it to uh, reassess and take notes. Okay, next up we have Paul Ruta. <clears throat> All right, all right, I got on. Um, yeah, hi everybody, uh, Paul Ruta. I'm Director of Facilities and Maintenance at, for Manhattan Beach Unified School District. And we're interested in uh, uh, electric vehicle charging and adding solar. We have some solar at our high school, but we would like to expand it and uh, be a little bit greener. Thank you, Paul. Okay, next up, Matthew Spiegelman. Hello, everyone. Matthew Spiegelman here representing Cabrillo Unified School District. I'm working as Cabrillo Sustainability Manager. I'm very interested in EV fleet transitions, uh, water recollection, and solar. Thank you for hosting today. Thank you. Joel Cadiz. Hi, uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Joel Cadiz. I'm the Executive Director of Facilities and Maintenance over at the uh, Foothill De Anza Community College District. And I'm interested in EV chargers for sustainability and all gender simply because they are a big part of a bond that we just passed two years ago that um, right now we are starting because the pandemic, we were delayed a little bit. And so we are um, starting that and we just passed our energy master plan a year ago and we are in the process of passing our um, uh, sustainability master plan. And if I may put in a plug, I am also looking for a manager of sustainability. <laughs> <laughs> that's a great, great opportunity to add a plug. Thank you for your master plan information. That's, uh, that's really good news to hear. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, we have Kay Page. Hi, this is Kenneth Page with Banning Unified School District. I'm the Director of Maintenance Operations and Transportation. Um, Ferdos Fazeli. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Ferdos Fazeli with Long Beach Unified School District. I am a planning project manager and uh, I'm here just to learn and see what are the upcoming oh, changes. I, I think it's presenting Okay, next up, Iris Salazar. Hi, um, my name is Iris. We, I am from Santa Clara Unified School District. I am helping my director, Michelle Hilly, um, on this meeting. We are interested in the um, electrical vehicle charging and um, solar panels. We are doing several master plans for our, our school district, and um, we need uh, some help with energy. Uh, electrical chargers since we're going to be touching a lot of our parking lots and redoing them so we understand we need a setup for um, charging stations so that was one of our topics that we were interested in thank you uh, next up ty key yes hello can you see me and hear me 
Yes, we, we can, can hear you. Okay, there we go. go. Okay. Hi, I'm uh, with Los Angeles Unified School District. I'm in the facilities standards group, and um, I'm interested in hearing about the EV chargers for um, Cal Green. Yesterday, we did a lengthy uh, presentation uh, about Title 24 and 2022 changes and heard a lot about the, the uh, solar panels and the batteries that are going to be uh, required next year. So now, now we want to learn more about the EV chargers that Cal Green is requiring. Right now we're just doing the infrastructure for the chargers. Okay, thank you. Uh, and next up, Sydney Hawkins. Hi, Sid Hawkins. I am a project management supervisor for San Diego Unified. Um, we we currently have a pretty robust uh, PV uh, installation program. We're at about 50% self-generation at this point. <clears throat> We're looking to see how codes are going to change as we move forward, incorporation of battery storage, and also as uh, many of uh, of uh, other uh, many of the others have mentioned ev charging is really piquing our interest because while we have provided a lot of infrastructure um, we're looking to see how the changes are going to affect our non pv projects uh, such as uh, you know site modernizations and so forth uh, and just uh, sustainability in general and how the code's going to be uh, driving more and more uh, sustainability measures All right, that is all of the hands raised or raise hands. Oh, sorry, one more. Uh, Hannah Ritchie. Hi, I'm Hannah Ritchie. I'm with Western Plaza Unified School District. I'm the Assistant Director of Facilities, and I'm interested in the EV chargers and the gender use restrooms. All right, and T. Slupton. Yes, good afternoon. My name is Tad Lupton. I am the manager of architecture for RRM Design uh, in San Juan Capistrano and uh, new, fairly new to California. So I'm very interested in all of the codes that are being uh, rolled out next year. So thank you for having me. All right, unless there are any last minute submissions, all, all the raised hands, we're good. Oh, wait, one more. <laughs> Yes. All right, Nancy, go ahead. Sorry, folks, I, I'm a consummate rule follower. And since your instruction said only those from LEAs, I was waiting till the end. But Nancy Chaitis Espinosa with the School Energy Coalition, so an association that includes many of the of the folks and the type of organizations you have here. Um, we are um, interested in all things school facility related, but primarily anything that has to do with sustainability, energy efficiency, z and &E. So a uh, pleasure to be here with you all. And uh, appreciate the rule following, but don't don't mind the interjection either. So thank you. Okay, so I will move on to our next slide at this point. It looks like that's all the hands raised. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, if, if you are a, a person of interest, we really appreciate your involvement today. Just wanted to um, focus our uh, introductions for time purposes to uh, those LEAs. Thank you. Uh, so a uh, quick note on the agenda. Uh, so we'll talk a bit about uh, the administration of the workshop, some of the rules, speaking of rules. Um, we will, um, we've, we've already covered our introductions. We'll talk about the workshop purpose, uh, go over some general rulemaking uh, guidance and um, an overview on rulemaking in general and the schedule associated to that. Uh, we will talk about uh, the administration of the meeting. Then we're going to move into some specifics. We won't spend too much time on the administration, but we'll move into specifics uh, starting uh, with part 11, California Green Building Code, uh, mandatory and voluntary measures. And uh, starting with uh, Paul, we'll make some, uh, we'll have the discussion regarding electric vehicle, where we'll have a chance to uh, deal with some Q&A after that section. And then we will most likely be at a point where we're going, going to take a break. What I did hear in the introductions of the attendees is that there's a lot of interest in EV and we did anticipate that. So I, I would suspect we're going to be at a point where we'll take a quick 10 minute break after EV charging. And then we're going to move on to uh, Michelle Golden's presentation for carbon reduction. Um, then 
uh, I will close it up with uh, part five, the plumbing code. Um, and then we'll talk about wrapping it up, wrap up the meeting and what our next steps are going to be. Um, so uh, appreciate your time. And that's essentially what we'll be covering today. So workshop purpose, what I'd like to do is start um, with an introduction again of Ida Claire and uh, have her talk about DSA's goal in general, and then we'll get more specific with, with the workshop. Thank you, Eric. So um, again, welcome to everyone who's joined us today. First of all, I'm immensely pleased because traditionally our Calgary workshops uh, were in person prior to the pandemic and attendance um, was uh, not very, was weak. <laughs> and so I will say that to see uh, so many of you on this and to have on this session and to have so many people engaged because we are offering this virtually, we, we have found that the virtual option really does increase participation and attendance. So this is all good, very, very pleased. Um, I will let you know that a lot of our work this year has been in collaboration with Building Standards Commission and Housing and Community Development. While we try to align the standards so that um, they're easily understood specifically by design professionals and code enforcement entities, um, there are going to be differences in application. Obviously, uh, Housing and Community Development for residential mandatory measures, which we're not covering today, um, but the uh, requirements for schools in the non-residential mandatory measures, many of these align with what is being proposed by the Building Standards Commission. However, we are trying to target scoping requirements and um, even technical requirements if we need to, specifically to schools, and that's what we're delving into today. The regulatory process does require our public outreach, um, and so this uh, satisfies that statutorily mandated requirement for public outreach, but really a lot of our outreach has already occurred. We did hold a survey, which I believe we had about 200 responses, 170, 170 responses. We had a survey on electric vehicle charging. Um, that was a great response. It was very instrumental in uh, having us understand, you know, the desires of the school districts and where they want to proceed with EV charging. And that constitutes part of our uh, outreach. So we had initiated this with that survey, but also our collaboration on the carbon um, reduction measures that we are addressing was also, uh, we have a collaborative comprised of industry professionals. Um, the American Institute of Architects, the Structural Engineers Association of California, um, uh, BSC, DSA, HCD. Um, we have national people represented on that group, New Buildings Institute, Rocky Mountain Institute, um, USGBC, United States Green Building Council. Um, and I know I'm going to be uh, missing someone, but all concrete uh, industry folks, steel industry folks, We've had a lot in that collaborative. I just wanna um, let you know that what we're presenting today when it comes to carbon reduction is really kind of dipping our toe in the water in addressing embodied carbon in Cal Green. And that is an alignment in the statewide goal. Um, so understand that there, uh, BSC will be proposing measures, uh, um, carbon reduction that are aligned with what we're proposing for schools for non-residential construction. And, um, and so I, want, I wanted to bring that forward. The collaborative will continue to meet and work uh, as we move forward. Um, while we are only introducing the, the uh, limited measures today in the intervening code cycle, the collaborative will continue to be future forward and um, look towards um, future editions of the code, 2025, triennial and beyond. So uh, understand that our work is ongoing, but in satisfying the public outreach for the code cycle, the, our work with the collaborative, our survey, this meeting today um, starts the pre-cycle activities, which are engagement with our stakeholders. Um, you're covering a little bit about where this is going later, correct? Yes. Yes, okay. Yeah. So I don't wanna dwell any further. I just wanted to, to let you know and clarify a little bit. Um, this, what we're presenting here is um, Building Standards Commission website. Um, and uh, Eric may talk about this a little bit, but you can see the Cal Green Electric Vehicle Workgroup. That is also in alignment with BSC. 
Um, the plumbing code focus, the all gender plumbing code, that's a, a, a workshop with uh, building standards. Um, and the Calgary Carbon Reduction Collaborative is our work with building standards. DSA is not proposing anything for bird friendly design. So I, I want to make sure that you understand that this is a snippet from Building Standards Commission website and not DSA. So we do have information on our website. Um, are you covering the Calgary Code Development page? In the uh, yes. Okay. So Eric will show you where that is on the DSA website. So you know as we progress where you can find more information moving forward. And um, with that, I'm going to pass it on to Eric. Probably took too long. No, that's, that's perfectly <laughs> fine. You are absolutely entitled. Um, the, I think she actually covered mostly everything I wanted to say um, and that is covered on the slide. I, I do want to reiterate, we are committed to collaboration. Um, while this, uh, this will serve as a uh, our collaboration prior to uh, submitting proposals. Uh, we will continue that collaboration with our stakeholders uh, after, after submission to the building standards code. So this certainly will not represent the only opportunity for input. We, we welcome and uh, really in, not only welcome, but, but we, really desire to have that input from our stakeholders. So uh, there, there will be a, an email presented towards the end of the website. If you have, if you do not have the opportunity to comment today, um, we, we welcome any, any and all comments uh, to that email address and we will continue to monitor that. I need to move that out. Yeah, yeah, I was Thank just you. gonna do that for you, Eric, sorry. <laughs> the X, yeah. There, we go. there is something on my screen masking some of the, <laughs> the presentation. Uh, so let's start with the um, with an overview of the building code. Um, as somebody in the introductions mentioned, that you were covering some of the upcoming changes. So uh, understand that uh, what we're proposing today is for the pre-cycle activities for the 2022 intervening code, as I mentioned in the uh, opening slide. Uh, what will become effective as of January 1 is Title 24 parts two through 12 of the 2022 California Building Code. That's our triennial cycle. Uh, what has already become effective as part of that triennial cycle, uh, that previous triennial cycle is the administrative code, which became effective March 1, 2022. But uh, again, those while published in July, uh, won't become effective until January 1. So it was really good to hear that you are receiving input on some of those battery storage requirements, solar requirements, et cetera. Those um, requirements that are part of 2022 building code, 2022 green code, Cal green code will become effective again, January 1, 2023. May I add something else, yeah. please? So I, I do want to inform that all of you that um, electric vehicle charging for new parking areas and additions to parking areas on your campuses yeah. will require chargers to be installed as of January 1st, 2023, if you're submitting that project to DSA for um, additions to parking areas and new parking areas. Um, please understand that uh, our, our goal with each triennials or with each coach cycle, which occurs in 18 month intervals, is that we, we seek to advance um, if not in 18 months, at least in the next three years. So understand that our goal here is, is either to correct what's not working and to move ahead and think bigger and press bolder. It's not to sit, to move back. So when, we, when we're looking at comments, understand that there are regulatory requirements in place. We will see how those work. Um, and, and we now are working at the next phase and the next improvement to, to even reach a little farther. So I, I, I want to understand, I want you all to understand the purpose of our regulatory development. Perfect, thank you. So as I mentioned, we are part, uh, this is part of the 2022 intervening code cycle schedule. And as you can see, th this graph is probably something many are familiar with. It's, it's available on the Building Standard Commission's webpage, but we're, we're really pretty early in that gray area, uh, maybe two thirds through it. Um, we are nearing, you know, I think, uh, or I mentioned previously that uh, we are going to be submitting 
um, in mid-October to building standards and, DS and DGS uh, proposed language. Um, so we are still pretty early. There will be public comment period, um, 45 and 15 day public comment period that we'll uh, receive um, input from our stakeholders, but there's also code advisory committee meetings that will be held in between December and, and March. So um, the, there are still many opportunities to affect the language. I think the large um, changes will um, be some, will be hashed out and uh, ironed out prior to December though. Uh, subsequent to that, large changes to the proposals uh, will not really be available to us. And uh, quick closing note, just note that these changes that we're discussing today would become effective July 1, 2024. Those are generally published in January of 2024. Uh, so uh, try to be as, we will be as expeditious as we possibly can, closing the meeting at four o'clock. We, uh, as you may have noted, the chat will be disabled. Uh, similar to our introductions, we'll um, take question and comment periods following each section, open to everybody, not just stakeholders. Um, but we do ask, um, I'm not, I don't have a watch or a stopwatch, but try to limit your uh, comments or questions to about three minutes. Um, just so that we can uh, be respectful to everybody who desires to comment. Um, use the raise hand function. We will again lean on Katie and Jessica to help us with uh, calling out your names and we'll, uh, then you'll have to unmute yourself and um, provide us with your comment or question. Uh, and at the end of the Zoom participants, we will give the opportunity to um, anybody that has called in I should ask Jessica, Katie, do we have call-in participants? We do not have any call-in participants right now. Okay, so that, that is a moot point. Um, if we happen to have some call-in participants, please let me know. Will do. As I mentioned earlier, we will take, we will continue to receive comments. The email on your screen, dsasscalgreen at bgs.ca.gov will be monitored for the purposes of receiving comments. Um, on this and uh, other Cal Green issues. So feel free to please email us at that email address and we will um, respond and um, include that in our, in our um, rulemaking files. So with that, uh, we will move on to the um, more technical aspects of the presentation and I will hand it over to Paul. Hello again, for anyone that's just joining, my name is Paul Johnson. I'm a senior electrical engineer at DSA. So just to give some background on um, our intent and, and where we're going with the EV charging, um, Governor Brown issued a number of executive orders. Um, most we'll cover later, but one he issued in 2012, he set a goal for um, 1 million zero emission vehicles by 2020. Um, and then as Governor Newsom came in to office, he set some additional goals, um, a few that we'll talk about later, but the one that really impacts um, EV charging is he set a goal that 100% of in-state sales of new passenger cars and trucks will be zero emission by 2035. Um, so with these, with these goals and with, the, with this direction that we've been given by our elected officials, um, DSA has been looking more at um, moving um, the EV charging in parking lots forward. Um, and we did, we took a big step for the 2022 um, Calgary code. Um, and again, Ida and Eric have touched on it. Um, and that comes into effect on January 1st of this next year. So about five months. Um, and so my language may, I'll try to keep it where I talk about this current code, um, which when I say current code, I'm thinking, I'll be talking about 2022. So sometimes I get myself a little confused because we're talking about code that's not applying yet or not <laughs> effective that we're talking about changing or updating. So, but those requirements um, for 2022 code, which is effective in 2023, require that EVCS or electric vehicle charging stations um, and the infrastructure be installed in parking lots at the time of construction. 
there's a t table in Calgreen that you can look at to see how many spaces are required or how many total spaces are in the parking lot. Um, but to break it down, really, it's 20% of new parking areas or new parking spaces um, need to be provided with EV infrastructure, and we call those EV capable spaces. And 25% of those EV capable spaces must be provided with an EV charger. Um, so we, as you can see, we took a big step of requiring chargers to be installed. Um, go ahead to the next slide. Um, and so as we've looked at that, and as we've continued to get um, guidance from our elected officials um, and trying to move closer to the goals set by the governor for 2035, um, we've looked at the code that we've already adopted. We've looked at where we need to go um, and talked about how we can get out or the outreach that we can do. And so I didn't mention this before, we've done four or three, um, three workshops with BSC, the Building Standards Commission, um, but we've had limited school participation in that. I think there's been maybe one or two um, schools or school districts that have called in and participated in that. And as we've gone further down the road with those workshops with BSC, we've, we've realized that on some areas that DSA may need to diverge from what BSC is going to do for non-residential buildings. And knowing the limited participation we've gotten in workshops in the past, we thought sending a survey out would be a good way to get feedback. <clears throat> and so, so that's why we did it. And so we're gonna talk about who responded to the survey, what was learned, um, and specifically when we talk about what was learned, we're gonna talk about management and then student versus staff needs. Um, go ahead to the next slide. So when we look at who responded, um, we, we, the first question we asked was, who are you? Um, are you district facilities? Are you district administration? Or are you someone else? And like we like we, I had talked about, we had 172 responses, which blew us away. We were, we were not expecting that. And these responses have really helped guide us as we continue to look at the data on where we need to go as, um, for these regulations. Um, and then we asked what where is your school district located? Is it rural? Is it suburban? Is it urban? And as you can see from the graph up there, um, one person skipped the, the question, but we have a very, very even distribution of where the school district's located. And, and that to us was big because in rural and specifically rural, you may have long distances students have to travel or teachers have to travel. Where with urban, you may not have a lot of driving to schools. Um, go ahead to the next slide. Next slide. So now as we got into what we learned, we asked, um, we asked which, which respondents ha currently have um, EV chargers on campus, on campuses or at facilities. And, um, and then we asked, if you do provide those chargers on campus, who are they provided to? Now, a lot of these questions that we have, we allowed them to be multi, um, you could choose all that apply. Um, and so as we looked at, um, looked at the responses, we realized that faculty and staff have the majority of, of spaces. And then students, um, specifically high school students have, um, have charges as well, but the staff are able to overflow into those charges. Um, and so we asked how, how this use is managed because currently if you don't have, if, if a student has charging, can they park in staff parking? Do, can they stay there all day? What's going on? That's That was an issue that we don't really have a good grasp on for schools. And so these are, these are the responses. And these responses I tried to encapsulate. I mean, we have over 150 responses. Some people chose not to respond to the written questions, but we have over 150 responses to most of the questions. And so I tried to encapsulate them when I'm pulling these out. So the responses vary from level one, level one subscription or paid at point of use. Another first come, first serve. Um, one, we don't micromanage our stations, just like grocery stores or shopping malls. We don't monitor time or create any sharing policies. Um, all level two charging, sorry, there's a thing in front of that. I don't think they see that, but you can. Oh, I, yeah, sorry, I can't read the <laughs> response. So I'm pulling it up on my screen. So all level two charging, charge point, charging stations, four hour max on charges enforced by campus safety patrol. Um, slash review. So there's a wide range of how, how the EV, 
EDCS is currently managed. And, and that gave us, there's, there's responses in there of things that we didn't think of. And so it really opened our eyes um, to how, how districts are currently working with these. So, uh, so next slide. Um, additionally, um, we asked, what's the appropriate level of charging? And we broke this up by student and by staff. Um, as you can see, the overwhelming majority of respondents <clears throat> indicated that level two charging would be um, the greatest need at campuses for, for the faculty and staff. Now, again, this is a question that you could choose level two, or you could choose all that apply. And, and so when you look at the level three and the level one and the level two, almost everyone that chose those two options also chose level two. Um, and so, um, so that gave us that gave us a pretty good understanding that level two are needed, and and so these are the responses um, based on um, what's going on. So level one, eight hour days provide faculty within twenty four to forty miles of miles of charge, sufficient to get home and return to work the next day. People are there for eight hours and travel no more than sixty miles after disconnecting. So um dcfc or level three charging level three would be ideal to allow for other vehicles to charge and individuals that commute more than 60 miles one way will be more likely to purchase an electric vehicle um, and then level two while some staff will stay park stationary all day other staff needs to move from site to site therefore they will need more rapid charging so this this response in level two the first one this this respondent actually indicated level two and level three and so that was something we didn't think about, or at least I didn't think about, was that you may, and, and applying it to myself, where my, my kids in their school have band teachers or um, speech therapists or other, other teachers that travel from site to site every day, where they, would, they very well could need that level three charging, um, depending on how far they're, they're traveling and, and what their schedule is. Um, the next comment, they will be there the whole day in most cases, possibly moving their car midday. Um, and then higher installation costs of DCFC infeasible. Most users will leave cars parked in stalls for half the day at least. DCFC is unlikely to be a benefit. Um, so you can see from the comments, we have a lot of different options and um, responses, um, which, which really was very good to help us to understand what was going on <clears throat> or the needs. So next slide. Okay, so now as we move into the appropriate level of charging to be offered to students, you can see level one and low level two jumps significantly. Um, and again, <clears throat> the, the option to choose all three was available and most all but one person that chose level DCFC um, also chose level two. <clears throat> and the same goes for the level one and level two. But again, as we read the comments, um, our students do not drive. That was a primary comment from I'm from K through through eighth grade. <clears throat> um, and then K through 12 campuses, high school students will remain stationary parked all day. Slower charging units will be less of a load on overall electrical infrastructure. Students have short commutes for the most part and aren't allowed in the parking lots during the day, so they won't be able to move their cars. That was a big one for us as we thought, at least for me, as I thought about it, that if we give them level two or level three, if a student parks there in the morning, they're going to take up that space all day. Um, <clears throat> and so then on to level two, one can charge during the day and have enough power to get home. At least level one could be provided. Level two would be ideal. Um, so again, a lot of these responses um, indicated that level one and level two would be the best option. So a variety. I think there should be one level of charging for all. Um, level two is a good compromise. Prefer a combo of level two and some threes. Um, greater distances, and this is from a rural school district, greater distances must occur for our students to travel to school. So as, as we look at these options or at these responses, the one thing that feels clear to us is that options are required or options are needed for the schools. Um, the school districts know their, their staff, they know their school, or their students better than, than we do. Um, and so it felt like to us, and this will be reflected in the code as we talk about it, that 
we need options. We need to give options so that schools can figure out what's best for them within reason. Um, and so I'm going to talk about, I'm, so if you go to the next slide, we'll talk about the draft proposals. And, and most of these proposals came from working with um, the work group with BSC, with the Building Standards Commission. And so some of these, we got comments on last week. And so some of them will change. I didn't feel um, right about changing them in here um, <clears throat> when we had published them last week and gotten comments. So um, some of them will change. Um, so these are the definitions. So the first definition is electric vehicle charging stations, EVCS. And that's one or more electric vehicle charging spaces served by electric vehicle chargers, receptacles or other charging equipment allowing charging of electric vehicles. Electric vehicle charging stations are not considered parking spaces. Next one, level one electric vehicle EV charge receptacles. And this is would be DSA specific if we allow level one. Um, a 120 volt, 20 amp minimum branch circuit and receptacle for use by an EV driver to charge their electric vehicle or hybrid electric vehicle. Low power level two electric vehicle EV charging receptacle. A 208, 240 volt, 20 amp minimum branch circuit and receptacle for use by an EV driver to charge their electric vehicle or hybrid electric vehicle. Level two electric vehicle vehicle supply equipment, EVSE. <clears throat> the 208, 240 volt, 40 amp branch circuit and the electric vehicle charging connectors, attachments, plugs, and all of the fittings, devices, power outlets, or apparatuses installed specifically for the purpose of transferring energy between the premises wiring and the electric vehicle. Before we go on too much further, I just feel it's um, important to note that um, as we look at this language, as Paul mentioned, there, there will be some changes to it. But um, one of the important aspects of specific language is that you recognize that when we're writing um, rulemaking or uh, express terms that will be ultimately included in the building code, Underlines generally mean new language. So all of these definitions are new. Um, and there are also, you, you will also see strikeouts as we go through and have present to you specific language that, that will be included in the proposed changes. Um, so again, all of these definitions would be new to uh, the Calgary Sorry. Um, just to clarify, I don't EVCS and level two EVSC is new. So those should not be underlined. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, because they apply now in January. I, I think they may have moved spaces. So that's why they're underlined. Okay. So the definition is there, correct? Okay. I just wanted to make sure that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> While we coordinate on the fly. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Next, slide. Next slide. Okay. Yeah. okay so, <clears throat> so currently, and, and I don't show. Um, the language that that's already been approved by the Building Standards Commission, um, but we will be changing some of the language that this applies to. Um, <clears throat> so um, we will be changing EVSE to electric vehicle supply equipment um, to create the EVSE and the number indicated. So a lot of this is indicated on that table um, that we we're not showing. So if you do have questions, feel free to look at that table. Um, and then we're changing some of the languages to clean it up um, and, and make it better. Um, and then also the last strikeout, we're moving that to a new location. Um, and then we're also adding level two. Um, so one of the things that we, we looked at um, is options. And currently in the code that's, that's been approved, um, there aren't a lot of options to reduce if, if you're not going to put in a level two 20 or level two 40 amp 240 volt charger, um, you don't get credit for that. So if you wanted to add a level one or a low level two, you can, that just doesn't count to the code um, and for the number. And so one of the things that we're trying to do is to allow the trade off. And so this one, so the second bullet point, the installation of each DCFC or level three shall I'm just saying level three so people are aware, shall be permitted to reduce the minimum number of required EV capable spaces without EVSC and level two EVSC by five. 
um, except that at least one level two EVSC shall be provided. So what's that saying is if you install level three charging, you can reduce the number of level twos required by five, um, except you still have to provide at least one level two in each parking lot. Um, the next one, the installation of four level one EVSC shall be permitted to reduce the number of required EV capable spaces without EVSC by one and reduce proportionally the required electrical load capacity to the service panel or sub panel. Um, a maximum of 10% EV ready level one spaces may be provided. So this is saying if you install level one charging, so 120 volt, 20 amp charger, you can read. So every four of those you install, you can reduce the amount of level twos by one. And then additionally, the installation of two low power level twos, so um, 240 amp or 240 volt 20 amp circuit, um, you can take two of those and reduce the amount of level two charges by one. Next. So it makes sense to pause again. Um, and just recognize the strikeouts and underlines. The, the language that is being modified is, part, is from the 2022 California Green Building Code, which uh, will become effective in January. So we are already just acknowledging, we are already working on rulemaking that will continue to revise that moving into the future, recognizing that due to the climate urgency and the emphasis placed on uh, electric vehicle inclusions for, for Californias or Californians, that, that there is an urgency we need to recognize and a pace of rulemaking that, that needs to acknowledge and react to that. So this is not language that's in the 2019 Green Code, um, it is changes specifically to the 2022 green code. Okay, and so on to the topic of giving choices um, to school districts. We have um, a new proposal for an alternative compliance method. Um, and this method, um, I'll just go ahead and read it, then I'll explain it. So use table 5106. 5.3.6 to determine the total power in kilowatts required based on the total number of actual parking spaces. So the alternative compliance shall include the following. Use any kilowatt combination of EV capable, level one, low power level two, level two, DCFC, EVSE. <clears throat> at, least one, at least one level two shall be provided. A maximum of 10 percent level one spaces each at 2.4 kilowatts may be provided. And then you see the table. So the table indicates from zero to nine, 10 to 25, 26 to 50, and it goes down. And it takes the, um, and there's a calculation done to get to the kilowatts in the next table, minimum kilowatts per capable space. So <clears throat> what this is doing is it's allowing you to install any combination with the minimum of 20, 120 volt, 20 amp circuit and up any combination of charging um, with, the, with the caveat that you have to install at least 120 amp or 140 amp level two 240 volt um, to meet the kilowatt requirements for your parking lot. So <clears throat> um, you can install all level twos, you can install all DCFCs or level threes, you can install level ones. Um, as long as you add up, so if you have 10 to 25 spaces, as long as you add up to 38.4, and again, there's some, with the, with the calculations, they will change a little bit as we refine it. Um, we know there's some errors in there at this point. Um, <clears throat> but in this scenario, you would, you would need to meet, as long as you install chargers that meet 38.4 kilowatts, you comply and in whatever variety you would like. Um, and so we felt that by doing this, it gives the option to do whatever the school needs um, or feels is best for them, whether it's charging in staff, whether it's charging in, in student, whether it's community college and it's shared charging, um, whatever that is. So next. So this gets us then to um, existing facilities. Um, do you want to take the comments on this one first, probably? And then I was just wondering. Yeah, I think yeah. you're managing the meeting, no, no, but I'm I thinking. Think so. 
Yeah, I think that's uh, good advice. Uh, what what we'd like to do, so as you saw from this slide, we do have some questions that we um, that we'd like to have input on specific to existing facilities. But instead of doing that, let's let's focus on the stuff that was that Paul just presented, and we'll take questions and comments on that, and we'll come back to the existing facilities. Uh, and if I may, Eric, one of the questions that I would like to ask is that in the 2022 Cal Green, there is a requirement for the installation of one level two charger, regardless of whether you go with level two or level three charging. In the present or in the addition of Cal Green that's going to be effective January 1st, there is no option for low level power two or one. And so, um, there, there was a path that we went through to align with uh, non-residential construction in Cal Green that BSC is dealing with in our language and require one level two. Um, as we proceed and we're defining what's appropriate for schools, I'd also like to get some comment if requiring one level two to be installed creates any kind of management concerns for schools because in meeting the code, you would need to provide one, and one might be a problem. So I'd like to, because we're offering additional flexibility and options, is the requirement to provide one level two going to be an issue? Because that would be in some way where we divert from non-res. So I'd like to just throw that out there. Okay. So Katie or Jessica, if you could uh, take the comments in order that the hands were raised. Absolutely. Uh, first up, we have James Frey. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Jim Fry. I work for 2050 Partners. We uh, support the California IOUs uh, Codes and Standards Organization. Thank you for including us in this activity. Uh, my question is uh, related to the survey respondents. Uh, specifically, is there an opportunity to serve the greater neighborhood after the school day is over uh, and uh, allow the neighborhood uh, charging customers that may not have access to charging, but still might be an easy walk to the building. Uh, what sort of uh, off of the school day value could these chargers bring? Thank you. Yeah, yeah, let's, let's so, uh, so James, we'll go ahead and respond your, to that. Yeah, thanks, James, for your comment. Um, the way Cal Green is structured is uh, we have the authority to write these regulations for California's public schools and community colleges. Um, so their appropriateness have to be in serving uh, that population, especially because of the costs involved is um, our we comes, comes from school funding, not necessarily from a public good other than public education is a public good, but I'm saying in that service that's being provided. So I will say that DSA will not address operationally how those chargers are used after hours. That's up to the school district, each school district, each school to figure out. Um, I will tell you that Calgary doesn't really address operational issues. It addresses building standards. And our building standards are really, uh, so like a school district can let us know that with the options and the way that they're designed, they can choose to, you know, say we're going to keep it open after hours and provide that service to the public. And we're going to, with the options that are provided, we're going to take that into consideration. Or a school may say, due to security issues or whatever, we're only going to address this for students and faculty. Um, that's up to each school. Cal Green will not address that concern. So I just wanted to clarify that. Thank you. Next, Tim. Pardon me. Uh, next, we have Mark Geller. Mark. Hi. Thanks. Hi. Thanks so much for having the, the, the opportunity to speak at this. My name is Mark Geller. I'm with the EV Charging for All Coalition. I am a co-founder and vice president of Plug In America, a nonprofit organization that's existed for the last 15 years to promote uh, uh, the adoption of electric vehicles. I personally have been driving only electric vehicles since 2001. Um, and I just have a few comments. Um, first, I think your definitions, by the way, are, are very good and all inclusive. 
I think the one thing that's not addressed, um, hasn't been addressed yet, is the question of the trade-off of the cost of various levels of power, um, the cost both to the district to install, to run over time, and to potentially the end user, and that that trade-off needs to be really well understood in to uh, decide what the appropriate level of charging to offer is. Um, I want to generally say, I mean, I, I, I hope I understand what you're proposing well, but I just sort of a reaction to what you have said, which is that to the extent you have, uh, I, I think a general rule is that lower power, and I'll just say low power, including both level one and low power level two, is likely to serve most of your users, um, staff, students, whoever. And so understanding that the lower cost, the lower impact on the grid of low power charging, um, and that that can serve more people with less power at lower cost is something to consider as you decide where sort of what basket things ought to be thrown into or what options ought to be available. Um, one thing to understand is that folks who don't drive electric cars often want faster power. Once they have electric cars, they understand the value of lower power. Um, more people served with lower power makes more sense than fewer people served with higher power, whether that's level full power level two or DC fast charging. Um, faster power at uh, workplaces can be very problematic as you end up with uh, charging stations or access points that are uh, remain uh, utilized despite the fact that there's no power being consumed because the car has already been charged to full, but the person can't leave the class um, in order to go move their car. So sharing equipment is something that probably should be avoided in preference to serving people lower amounts of power over longer periods of time. I saw a reference a number of times to a maximum allowance of 10% level one. And I think that's not a very good place to start um, given that you could conceivably find out in many of your schools, if not most, that for example, if everyone had an electric car, 50% of the folks would be very happy to plug in at level one, be very well served. Um, uh, and if you have a cap of uh, say 10%, you're just going to be self-defeating and you're gonna end up putting in more expensive power um, than is necessary. I think generally the consideration of DC fast charging at schools will probably be eliminated very quickly because it's so expensive. What you know, given what's going on with the federal government and state funding of DC fast charging, it is likely that there will be available DC fast charging near schools, um, or at least near enough, uh, and so that folks will have that opportunity. But to do it at a school district is likely to be both too expensive in terms of installation uh, and uh, sitting around for a half an hour while your car charges charges at a workplace is kind of generally incompatible. Um, let's see if I have anything else here. Uh, I think that's it for now, but I suspect I will uh, comment more as we go along with this uh, workshop. Thank you again very much. And if you have any questions for me as a very long-term driver, please feel free to ask me. Um, thank, you. thank you for those comments, Mark. I just want to remind you and everyone else who's not specifically from a school that our regulations are both for K-12 public schools and community colleges. We don't make a distinction in the, so DC fast charging may be um, suited for a community college application. So I just wanted to, to remind, um, just to remind you of that, so. Okay, I think I, I'm, I'm definitely aware to include that we're including city uh, community colleges okay. here. And I think the same probably applies regarding DC fast charging. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Next. Okay, next we have Sean Denniston. Hello, Sean Denniston from New Buildings Institute. We're also supporting the California IOUs. And I had a quick question before I make my comments. It's been very clear that the requirements apply to public K-12 and community, uh, but when you establish these requirements, do they apply to private and for-profit um, schools as well? 
You know, you would they would have to follow building standards commission non residential construction. They could use DSAs as a pathway, but they are not required to. All right, great. Thank you. You don't have the authority to write regulatory requirements for them. Mm -hmm. All right. And so just I to think clarify something else. Sorry, is that if there is a residential facility on school campuses, they would need to follow housing and community development regulations for EV charging because we um, that they should they take charge of residential construction. So it's it's a little complicated, except that would be for a parking lot that's tied specifically to a residential facility. If there is parking separate from a residential facility, say on a community college campus, then it would need to apply with DSA's requirements. So it get, does get a little complicated. <laughs> All right, so I have a, a few comments, um, starting with the definitions. Um, so looking at the definitions, I, I think defining level one differently than the market defines it. Actually, I think in all cases, having a code definition for something that is different from how the market defines something is always problematic for code usability. So the code, the, the market sees level one is just 120 volts, not without a minimum amperage. So I think that that could cause some confusion when it comes to implementation and enforcement. On the low power level two, um, unlike BSC's definition, which just said 20 amp, yours does say minimum, but at that point you're just defining level two. So, you know, uh, the, the definition also covers a hundred amp circuit that could be supporting level two. And at that point, I don't think we would consider it to be low level anymore. And low level doesn't, uh, level two doesn't go below um, a 16 amp charger, which is a 20 amp circuit in the market speak either. So it seems like this, there's maybe some extra verbiage that could be confusing because now you're incorporating non-low level into your low, level two. And then the same thing, um, the market is moving away from level three and just using DC fast charging as the way that it refers to those. So having a compatibility with the market speak, I think is useful uh, for code clarity. I also did want to highlight that there are some technical issues through the language, particularly in the alternate compliance path. Uh, there's a mixture of um, units, so, you know, kilowatt refers to actual power going through something. KVA is used for uh, circuit capacity, but they're used interchangeably in that system, which could cause quite a few problems. Uh, in the definition of level two EVSE, uh, it defines it as an EVSE on a 40 amp circuit, which means that you could be putting a 16 amp EVSE on that 40 amp circuit and still technically meet the code. And it prohibits um, any higher amperage um, circuits and EVSE from meeting that definition just because of the way that it's worded. And there are, a lot of places throughout the language that you prevent, presented with those kind of technical incompatibilities um, would become prob problematic as these code as the code language goes into effect. So I think uh, one overarching comment is just that really it, it's really important to really dial in that language because right now there that has quite a few of those problems. Um, I think that about covers it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Sean. Okay, next up we have Sid Hawkins. Hi, thanks for uh, taking my, I've got two questions. Uh, the first is uh, regarding what triggers the EVSE uh, or EVCS uh, requirements for parking lot upgrades. Um, is that I'm seeing additional parking, new parking, parking lot upgrades, that uh, typically what would trigger these? Um, is it anything as simple as restriping? or providing path to travel upgrades, or uh, what are we looking at here? So, so currently currently it's only if you add new parking. Um, and so what we'll be asking in the next, so we have another slide where we'll ask um, some more specific questions about existing facilities. Okay, fantastic. I'll look forward to those answers then. Um, the the we, second thing- We I, need I, answers I, from you though. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Oh, uh, 
uh, well, and, and and the reason I'm asking is because uh, you know throughout the district we're constantly doing uh, doing site modernization projects that that touch the parking lot. Uh, for instance, reconfiguring a parking lot to allow for a better pickup and drop off space that may actually reduce the number of parking spaces. Um, you know, and uh, like I said, uh, as part of other projects, we're doing a, a path of travel upgrades, which may mean reconfiguring a parking lot. Uh, in very yeah. few instances in, in our school district would we be adding a lot of parking spaces unless perhaps we're adding a new annex onto a facility. Yeah, and, and we'll dive more into that in a few minutes. But yeah, so currently, um, as the code stands, it's been approved. There's um, existing facilities are not required to do anything okay. unless unless adding new spaces. At this time, and I will tell you that obviously we encourage voluntary uh, installation of electric vehicle charging <laughs> always. So going above and beyond is encouraged. <laughs> I, I understood and. And yeah, it, it certainly is something that uh, that that our district is looking at and de trying to develop a standard for where and when and how to put, put these things in. Uh, the other question I had, it just out of curiosity, I saw in the definitions that it says EVCS are not considered parking spaces. Uh, could you explain a, a little bit the, the reasoning behind that language and how it might uh, affect the uh, our interpretation? Do you want to or I can? Why you go ahead? Okay. So, um, <clears throat> so the EVC, let me go back to it so I'm not misspeaking, but um can we go back to the definition? Yeah, we go back to the definition screen. There you go. Okay. So um yeah, maybe you should explain this. You can have okay. So understand that when we're talking about electric vehicle charging spaces, when we say they're not considered parking spaces, is that um, they're providing a different service. So in the context of the code, and you're looking at Cal Green, you're basing electric vehicle charging on the number of parking spaces. It doesn't mean that you're providing electric vehicle charging in addition to a minimum number of parking spaces that may be required under requirements of CDE under Title V if they cover that um, in non-residential construction in general, you know, local zoning ordinances have parking spaces. We say they're not considered parking spaces. You're basing the number of the electric vehicle charging stations you need to provide on the number of parking spaces, but because they have different requirements, uh, power provided, chargers, they provide a different service, and also that uh, understanding that you can limit the amount of time that uh, someone is in that space through management. So generally, you can't limit the amount of time someone occupies a parking space. Um, I, I suppose you can, but generally parking spaces in the, in, in the greater context, their, their use is essentially unlimited. Once people park there, they can park there for as long as they need to. Charging spaces are different. So it, when we say they're not considered parking spaces, yes, you're parking the car, but you're parking the car to get charging more so than you're parking the car to park there. So like you can put up signage at your schools that say, if you don't have an electric vehicle, you can't park here, right? And that's why they're not considered parking spaces. When we go to access compliance requirements that are in CDC Chapter 11B, there is a separate distinction um, when we're talking about electric vehicle charging spaces because there's accessibility requirements for electric vehicle charging spaces and, electric, and accessibility requirements for parking, and they're handled differently. So Cal Green bases the number on parking, but it sets the stage that it's providing a different service. And so you can manage it differently is essentially what it's saying. Does that make okay. sense? Oh, it, it 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 totally does. And so, if I understand correctly, if if other requirements are driving us to have a minimum of let's say 100 parking spaces for a facility, and the the EVCS would be encompassed within would be satisfied within that 100 spaces, as opposed to having to add the 101st, 102nd, and so on space. Correct. But that also provides for uh, state the California state law requirements that says um, you can't park for limited times in parking spaces unless there's certain exceptions, right? There's different laws mm -hmm. that cover electric vehicle charging in the state. 
So you can't call them parking spaces because they're charging spaces is essentially the way it works. <laughs> very good. Uh, thank you very much. And generally speaking, the, num the number of, well, specifically speaking, the number of parking spaces is a local ordinance issue and not a building code issue. Thank you. Okay, next uh, raised hand, Katie. Uh, Ferdos Fazelli. Hi, uh, I, I just want to make sure I understand the statement earlier made uh, through the presentation is correct, that electrical charging stations should be included in for construction starting in January 2023. So let's say if I have a new construction with parking space going in DSA sometime toward the end of 2022, should I provision charging stations in the design because the construction will take place in January 2023? Um, no, so the code requirements are effective January 1st, 2023 for to install chargers. Um, your project is under the 2019 California uh, Green Building Code, which requires infrastructure to be provided, but does not require a charger to be installed. Of course, we encourage you to install chargers, but it's not a requirement in the code under the 2019 code which if your project is submitted prior to December 31st, 2022, would be under the 2019 code. And the requirement is for infrastructure to be provided, not, not the charger, exactly. Thank you. Next. Next, we have Janet Dixon. Hi, Hi thanks everyone. Um, I just had a question. It sounds like the number of <clears throat> EV chargers are going to be per lot. Um, so do they have to be separated into each lot? And my question about that kind of goes to your, your future questions. If I've got a fairly remote lot, it's going to be cost prohibitive possibly to get the EV charging um, installed down there, it may have less supervision. Would it be possible that if I need to char uh, install EV chargers, I can pick a lot that and maybe put them together? I, you know, ADA spaces are dispersed through each lot for a reason, but is it necessary to have EV chargers dispersed throughout every lot? Okay, thank you for your question, Janet. I will say that the regulations, so in, in code application, the regulations apply to all facilities generally, but we understand that each facility is sometimes unique, right, and has its own issues. And so the code has provisions for alternate means and methods, and that's a discussion between you or your, your whoever you send to DSA to have that discussion. We encourage you to have a pre-application meeting highlighting the um, the, the challenges that the clear text of the regulations pose and uh, entering in a discussion with DSA as an alternate means. It may be that we say, okay, where can you install them? That, that makes more sense. Or so it just depends, right? I guess I should say is um, the regulations are there because we're writing them not for a specific site. We're providing that we're, we're writing them for a specific uh, not building type, but facility type, right? But we understand that, you know, even every local jurisdiction has the opportunity to address the equivalency of what the regulations require via alternate means than what's specified in the code. And that just requires a, an engagement and discussion with DSA since we're the jurisdictional agency and, um, and, and proceeding in that manner of saying, having DSA say, okay, yeah, that's an equivalent. Is that okay? okay? That, that's great. Thank you. Thank you for the question, John. It's a really, really good point that I'm sure will be, uh, many schools could, could be affected by. Next up. All right, next we have Sean Dennison. Hello, uh, just following up on your description about the electric vehicle charging station, I, I wanna say your explanation makes sense, um, 
but when you read the definition that you've lined out, it the definition doesn't align with what you've said. And the definition really doesn't make sense. I think as we have dealt with code officials, and I know that code officials aren't necessarily gonna be the ones enforcing this, but if you read that, that definition, the, the plainest text reading of it is, they're not automobile spaces, they're not parking spaces, therefore they're in addition to whatever parking spaces are already being required. I mean, that's kind of the plainest language meaning of it. So I think that this, this definition really needs quite a bit of work. Um, it also talks about electric vehicle chargers, even though electric vehicle service equipment is the code defined term. So that's another thing that can be, um, that can be modified too. So I, I think just having a definition here that is so similar to EVSE, but is different, and then has this confusing contradictory phraseology in it that and if you look at the history of Cal Green, you can kind of see how it's emerged and why it's emerged. Um, but I, I think there's a real opportunity to fix this. I know that that means probably coordinating with BSC and HCD because it's it's in Cal Green. It's not just in your section of Cal Green. But I think this definition is particularly confusing and it is going to really be a roadblock to people effectively implementing the code. So, and I think it's just wordsmithing to get it in the right place where it makes a lot of sense. I mean, the where it says electric vehicle charging spaces, um, you can almost just take that spaces off because really all you're talking about is that connector between the EV and the grid that gets supplied to a parking space. So I, I think it's a uh, it's a solvable problem, but I think it's a very real problem with the language right now. Um, thank you, Sean, for that comment. Um, always, we welcome opportunity to improve language. You're welcome to use the email that we have and make a suggestion. I do want to clarify that you're correct. We do work with BSC on this, and electric vehicle charging station has been in the code for some time. Not saying that it doesn't need to, uh, an opportunity for an upgrade if one if it's there as we advance regulations. So I do I do value and appreciate your comments. I do also. <laughs> Sorry about that. I do also want to let you know that California does have a state law that was passed that has told every single jurisdiction, including the SA, that um, uh, when we're talking about charging spaces, that they are not to be they are to be considered in the total number of parking spaces that are required by local zoning zoning ordinances. Again, as I stated, our goal here was to say when they're not considered parking spaces, it's because they're providing a different service. We do have a note in the code that does say a re, uh, the, the zoning requirements that says they're to be considered in the total number, but we say they're different. So right here, my point is, is what you're seeing here is independent of its context in the code and independent of context of um, direction that's already been provided to the state of California from statute. I understand that, you know, the, not, notwithstanding, I do understand that it can always be re improved, but I do want to make sure that we're not looking at this necessarily in a microcosm. We are here, but in the context of the code, it's not. So I just wanted to add that little bit of clarity, but we always welcome uh, improvement on language. So you please provide it if you, you know, especially in where you had discussed before, where there was conflict, uh, provide a solution and we will look at it and discuss it further. I'll add a little bit more context. We supported San Jose when they put their electrification reach code into place that included electric vehicle um, requirements and they avoided this term because it was so confusing. They found that it was such an implementation and usability problem that they just avoided it in their language, even though it's in the underlying language. So. Um, I think the the confusion that's caused, even with a note there, is is worth addressing. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm just confirming there are no other raised hands. Oh, we got one. We got one more. Okay. Okay, Paige, you want to go ahead and unmute yourself? Yes. Hi, this is Ken from Banning Unified. Is it possible for us to download a copy of this uh, PowerPoint presentation to have it for before we begin? Perfect. Um, Ida and I were sort of passing notes that we will make uh, a link to this PowerPoint presentation this, and the survey um, on our webpage. 
And uh, perhaps make, and are we recording this video? We are recording. And this so video. we will also look at the putting a recording of the video for those that didn't have a chance right. to purchase because then it gives greater depth on explanation. So. <laughs> Well, that suffice, Ken. That's it. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay, hey, next we have Marcos Rodriguez. Hi, Marcos. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my question is, uh, with the development of charging stations that are mobile, like a beam system or even charging system that can be moved around as needed on a respective campus, how do the rules apply to those types of units? So we address, thank you, Marcos. It's good to see you. Um, like see you on the screen. Um, I will say that um, uh, our, we are responsible for building standards, which means they're fixed elements. Um, if, uh, as the example that Janet raised earlier, you have a remote lot where there's a requirement and if there's difficulty, we can consider something that's mobile as an alternate means, but it, it, we would have to do it on a case-by-case -case basis, depending on your site, depending on the issues, depending on the problem. So I will say that right now, that the requirements for mobile charging do not meet the minimum requirements in the building code because we are looking, we can only produce building standards. Those are fixed elements. But in the context of alternate means, something that's portable may be considered as an equivalency, again, site by site, issue by issue. All right, thank you so much. Welcome. Any other raised hands? I see no other raised hands. Okay, so then uh, if there are no other raised hands, I think um, it, it was earlier mentioned um, and questioned whether or not uh, some of these new requirements would address the existing facilities. And we are interested in that topic as well and uh, would like to receive some feedback. So uh, we have, we, this is again, sort of an extension of our question comment period, but we have some specific questions that we're interested in gaining some feedback on. Um, I think it was mentioned that it, you don't often upgrade or excuse me, add new parking lots to an existing parking lot. So that, that's sort of a subpart B um, to question number one, but how often are parking lots upgraded? Um, question two, are there, are there future projects and or desire to install solar in parking lots? And I heard that there is interest in that in, but from some of you in our, uh, uh, in our introductions uh, slides. And then what obstacles would pose a high cost to adding chargers in existing parking lots and what could mitigate this? So again, I'll give you a few minutes to think about it or maybe a minute or so to think about it, but we'll start taking some raised hands. Can I, can I add just a little yeah, bit? So yeah, sure. I, I want you to know that the three of us here it, it really kind of explored options for charging in existing lots. And we looked at, if you were updating a building, upgrading a building, and it was within a distance of a parking lot, requiring it, because we understand that um, how often are parking lots upgraded, we don't know. We know that buildings are upgraded, but they may not be near parking lots on a campus, which may then require a long distance service uh, to be installed, you know, uh, conduit and, and infrastructure for a long distance. So I think that, you know, we're, we're trying to gather some information. Um, we think that in installing solar photovoltaics in a parking lot, that would be an easy way to address charging uh, as, a, as a baseline, but looking just for feedback in general on when you upgrade your parking lots, what is the work you're doing? How often does that occur? Is it just slurry and striping? How often do you go deeper? Um, for what reasons do you do that? Uh, just some perspective to us from the from the schools. Yeah, and again, we've received various um, feedback on some of our previous meetings, uh, perhaps a cost threshold to a building alteration. And after considering how that might affect schools and a particular alterations budget, we're not convinced yet that that is the appropriate 
resolution in this code cycle, uh, but would be interested in hearing um, in context of that question three, what obstacles would, would pose a high cost of adding chargers and existing parking lots. Uh, that, that would give you a little bit of context of what we, we have been considering. And, and I would like to just add that we don't, we are not often fond of tying it to construction costs because when there's construction cost volatility, you are then exponentially increasing the costs, right? Already costs go higher and then it's requiring something else on top of it through items we can't control, construction cost volatility. So just throwing that out there. <laughs> You have a raised hand. Excellent. Thank you, Sydney. Uh, just to get the conversation started, the, the first thing that jumps to my mind is the existing electrical capacity at, at any given site, because uh, based on you know the, the proposed uh, the proposed power that you had on the table there, you're looking at you know 100, 200 amp additional uh, service that, that's required. And uh, I, I would say that one of the obstacles would be, in, in many cases, getting the the service upgrade from the existing utilities, especially given the fact that at some point our schools are going to be competing with other commercial entities who also have to put in EV charging stations. So, um, you know, the, the utilities I could see as being a being a, a bottleneck. Uh, the other thing was all, was all was already mentioned as well. And that is the proximity of some parking lots to existing electric infrastructure could require just some immense uh, trenching if we have to provide EV charging in every parking lot as opposed to, uh, you know, uh, consolidating our EV charging in, in, in one, one lot, for instance. or Jessica, if you want to control it from here on out. No problem. Sean, you're next. Sure. Thank you, Sean Dennison, New Buildings Institute, supporting the California IOUs. Uh, for when it comes to existing buildings and existing sites, uh, we think that it makes a lot of sense to really key in the requirements to specific kinds of construction activities. So think about what can support what can help support the future installation of EV charging infrastructure? Um, I think the, the example of the electrical service is a great one. You can have a, the trigger be when you upgrade the electrical service that is serving a parking lot, then you can size it for a certain amount of EV charging. Um, whether that's based on the new construction levels or a lower level or a higher level even, which might make a lot more sense just you know keying in so that if you replace your service you're replacing it with a service that will accommodate the charging but not necessarily everything else that's involved and so uh with the parking lot you know a, a similar idea probably if you're just you know uh, if you're a uh, seal coating you probably don't want to have anything but sometimes parking lots do get their surfaces torn off or there is other trenching work happening in the parking lot and so when that happens that's a great opportunity you know if the surface is actually being replaced to go ahead and trench and put in the conduit for um, for these spaces in the future before coming in and putting in a new surface. I th with all of these, the key is what is a good and reasonable add-on without going too far. So in the case of replacing the, the surface, if you required full compliance to actually bring in EV charging, well, then you're not just talking about conduit, you're talking about the wiring, and you're probably talking about triggering a, a service upgrade at that point. Maybe not, but there's a good chance. And now you've made you know, that project cost prohibitive. So really constraining the scope of the requirements, I think is really important and creatively thinking about what are our triggers that, that can be piggybacked on. And then I think the last thing is uh, looking at um, you know something like a substantial improvement, you know, which is defined in the code. It it sets a really high level, a really extensive project in terms of alterations to the building. That that might be a reasonable time to attach some level of EV charging to the project because at that point we're already talking a substantial project. We're talking about practically making a building into a new building. And so it's more reasonable to accommodate EV charging um, requirements into a project of that scope 
scope creep is always an issue, so have to pay close attention. But I think that's really the key is to, to think about specific construction activities that you can append specific EV infrastructure elements to, to really making that effective. But I think maybe one of the biggest things, I think the comment that you got earlier about they have buildings being built right now under a previous code, which has EV capable in that. And I think a trigger for converting existing EV capable spaces to an EV charging station is probably one of the most important things that can be done because that should be your lowest impact EV um, project on an existing building is converting uh, EV capable. And so whatever that threshold is, um, you know, whether it's a specific kind of construction event or if it's a substantial alteration or if it's, you know, an, an alteration with a certain level of um, work area, something like that. But I think that that at the very least is probably the most reasonable thing to include for an existing buildings uh, requirement. Thanks. Thank you, Sean. And I would echo that last statement that that's clearly um, an underlying intent on the original requirement to provide EV capable spaces is that someday charging would actually be installed inside that infrastructure. And so, yeah, I think that that's, that's an easy one that's accomplished. Sure. <laughs> Thank you for that. Next raise hand. Okay, next we have Gabriel Sherman. Good afternoon, Gabriel Sherman, Ukiah Unified School District. Um, so Sydney, I wanna go back. Sydney made some points on the, um, the obstacles and, and you know, I just want to hit the obstacles first. Uh, you know, from our perspective, I kind of want to, I'd like to underline all of them he hit. Uh, the other one is just age of infrastructure. Uh, I, you know, I know DSA has quite a bit of information on the average age of California schools in our district. It's uh, the median age is about 50 years. And this switch gear is probably undersized for a lot of these uses. And on top of that, it's usually in a, in a, um, in a location that's really not uh, feasible for for easy access to parking lots. Typically, it's in the middle of a campus or in a building. Um, you know, none of these campuses were designed to have any major power or load in the in the parking lots. If there's if there are um, pull tops, it's typically one smaller circuit. So that's a constraint, certainly. Um, and then, as far as when the parking lots are are upgraded, you know, typically it will be. Um, in response to a to an ADA upgrade on a larger project, or if it's done, um, you know, by itself, it's typically, if it is even um, goes through review with DSA, it's just AC review. So, you know, one of the questions I have is if there is a standalone project a district does to upgrade their parking lot, would this trigger um, a larger review, and that would require other design professionals to be involved, and then would would also scope creep from the contractor. So now we're not talking about having a um you know one one single type of contractor we'd actually have to go to a general contractor have multiple subs in it so there's a lot of pieces to unpack here to think about um i definitely think it was part of a larger project a modernization project this definitely has a component that should be involved but i'd want to make sure that we're not um narrowing the ability or truncating the ability of districts to make things better on their campuses um and and really blowing up both the projects and the cost and the timeline of the projects as well so um, thank you for your consideration. Thank you, Gabriel. Next, we have David Daniels. Well, I can certainly agree with what was said by Gabriel and also Sean. Uh, I couldn't agree more wholeheartedly, uh, particularly with uh, Gabriel's comments about, and, and also Sean to that effect, uh, the interdependency of some of these requirements is, it just blows your mind sometimes. And further, it blows your budget out of proportion. So, you know, take a stadium improvement project that we got going on in a certain section of the uh, campus, you know, and you're having to provide uh, parking upgrades, you know, all the way across on the other side of campus, and you're having to upgrade every ADA path of travel between point A and point B because things are just, you know, half a percent out of compliance, which I get it's half a percent out of compliance, but. The bottom line is, is it adds about $500,000 or more to the cost of the project, depending on how much you have to do. And uh, when you think about the cost of one EV charging station, let's just say, let's just play with that number. And you think about that and you think about all of the uh, ADA path of travel upgrades, the restroom upgrades, I can't emphasize enough. 
uh, those all those triggers are killers, and they are. There's just no bigger killer than some of the ADA upgrades, and they, they squash a project uh, often sometimes, because I can come up with the budget to do the specific project that we want to do, but I can't always come up with the money or justify the the spending the money for some of the other upgrades. So it oftentimes ends up becoming and serving as deterrent. Uh, these these requirements and these triggers. So it is something to keep in mind to Gabriel's point, to Sean's point, and, and perhaps others on here, is the these triggers are sometimes project killers. Actually, often, I will say, and at least in our case, because um, that and using uh, certain restricted funds that, you know, funding sources that say, okay, well, you can use it on this, but you can't use it on that. Um, you know, the question is, is, you know, what kind of funding sources are going to be out there that are going to be restricted just, just doing the charging station. So for example, Southern Cal Edison, you know, comes with these proposals about how they're going to help fund you and put a, a charging station in, and maybe one, maybe more at a particular site. Yeah, they'll cover the cost of that specific piece of equipment, uh, but they may not be able to assist you with the architect engineering fees, and they may not be able to help shoulder the cost of the triggered ADA upgrades that now exist because you've you know decided to alter certain parts of campus. So just keep that in mind as a bigger picture and in, to add to what Gabriel and, uh, and Sean have said. Thank you, David. David, what school district are you from? Sorry, I'm with Morongo Unified School District. And we have no EV charging stations. We have a few in the community. Uh, Tesla is putting a charging center in Yucca Valley, California. I think they're putting in a bank of about 10 off of Highway 247 and Highway 62. They're at the corner. And then we have in 29 Palms proper, we have, a, if I had to guess, probably with the casino uh, that is on the, uh, uh, with the tribe, the local tribe here, uh, I would say there's probably as many as about 10 here in the town of 29 or city of 29 Palms. Uh, I do know that there is a little bit of interest being expressed. Our new superintendent that we just have drives an EV. Uh, we have another uh, senior person here at the district that drives an EV uh, from quite a far away, probably two hours away. And so they're looking for you know charging opportunities. And um, we're starting to purchase a couple of hybrids. Uh, but because of the rural nature of our district, I don't know that we're going to be going to a lot of uh, electric, you know, like service trucks, um, tra student transportation, et cetera. Um, but uh, that just kind of gives you a little bit um, better picture of what our demographic and what our environment looks like up here. Thank you. Before we move on to the next raise hand, I'm just going to do a quick time check. We're an hour and a half into this. We do have other agenda items. So I'll, I'll just ask that everybody, um, we are interested in the feedback. We do have an email uh, that you can also email us. I'm not going to cut you off right now, but just please uh, be mindful of the time. All right. Next first hand. The next hand is Ferdos Fazelli. Uh, hi again. I just wanted to tag along uh, David's comments regarding cost. Uh, and I just wanted to add a point when these parking structure upgrades are near a building, near an existing building uh, that also goes through improvement. If uh, the IR uh, EB 4 applies, then this cost also triggers the seismic upgrades of the buildings. And that's may also kill the project or we would not have enough funds to add this electric charging and uh, electrical upgrades and also seismically upgrade the buildings that are part of the project. Thank you for this. Thank you. All right, and uh, lastly, we have Gabriel Sherman. Yeah, I, I had one more follow up comment and it kind of is in line with the last one. I'm, I'm sure you've considered this, but I'd be a little bit concerned by feedback loops on this. So, you know, again, in my experience, one of the largest triggers and one of, one of the largest reasons you'd update a parking lot would be uh, an accessibility trigger on another project. And I would just be, I would want to be mindful, you know, would the 
say we're we're upgrading something middle of campus that triggers an accessibility you now have to do a pickup and dropping drop off um improvement for accessibility um, i think we'd want to have clear language or understanding of how that would relate to the charging station so would one trigger the other and i think and clarity would be really look for a domino effect so we yeah. hopefully would <laughs> Because we understand the access compliance improvements occur. Often. Yeah, I sure you do. And in, limited, in right? more All detailed than any of us. Yeah. Stall. Exactly. So right. And I just I think the clarity item would be important because, you know, one of the other pressure points that we all face is project timelines and wanting to make sure we're not going through the design development, doing a pre con with DSA and then hitting with a something else. So now we're going to have to change gears and, and design a probably pretty substantial project inside another one if that makes sense. So I just, again, clarity to our design teams would be important on this. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Gabriel. I will add to the fact that while these are regulatory requirements and our goal is to write language that is enforceable, um, there is the benefit that we're the only enforcement entity for the public schools and community colleges. So, yep. you know, creating some guidance on that and some clarity within our own staff is helpful instead of having it trying to address that through 500 local jurisdictions. So, yeah, understood and agreed, and we appreciate yeah. it, Lauren. But thank you for that comment. We will have to look that we don't create a domino effect when it's inappropriate to do so. Perfect. Thank you. Sean, we you might have the last comment. Sure. You asked the question about obstacles, and I think one of the obstacles is the restrictive application of load management in Calgreen. Uh, and for existing buildings, I think that's particularly problematic, um, just that it's uh, load management is only allowed on above code requirement spaces. It's not allowed on all of the spaces. Um, the, the minimum charging, minimum simultaneous charging uh, is 50% power, which you know, if you're trying to get as many spaces into an existing building as possible, maybe more aggressive um, simultaneous charging would be appropriate, bringing that down to you know, 1.5 kilowatts, you know, especially for these long dwell time schools. So I think that the load management requirements that are in Calgreen already are uh, not optimized for new construction and are particularly not optimized for existing buildings. So allowing broader and more aggressive use of load management to make use of what service avail um, capacity is available, particularly variable um, uh, capacity that's available. There are load management systems that will actually monitor the total load on the service and allocate power based on what the building isn't using. And since the electrical code requires so many safety factors, that can actually be a substantial amount of power and if you just allowed um, them to use that um, a more aggressive, more sophisticated, more dynamic uh, load management, then you could avoid some of these service um, replacements that might be triggered by these requirements and applying them to existing buildings. Thank you, Sean. Great, thank you. Really, really valuable input uh, up to this point. Uh, I, I appreciate all of the feedback and all of the comments. Um, again, just to summarize, we will place uh, a link to this presentation, the survey, and the recording on our website. As of right now, quick time check, it is 2.42, so I'd like to allow us for about a 10-minute break uh, before we enter into the carbon uh, reduction portion of this presentation and this workshop. 2.50? So, uh, yeah, 2.52, we will start again. Thank you, everyone.
Well, I hope uh, everybody enjoyed your short little break. We do have a, a full agenda. So uh, pardon me while I shut the door. Uh, excellent, excellent feedback we received. Um, from this point on, we're going to transition on to uh, the other portions of the um, agenda, which specifically uh, means we're going to be talking about carbon reduction. Um, I do see, James, your hand up, and I don't know if that's um, accidental. Uh, we'll, we'll take questions and comments and feedback on this section at the end of Mickey's uh, presentation. Is your question more general though? Thank you for being supportive of my raised hand. I'm trying to uh, complete a, a thought from the last uh, section and that is, where are all of your, uh, your, your text changes uh, in, in one place uh, for the intervening cycle? Is there a, a single place for that or should we rely on the, the PowerPoint that you guys use today? So I, I would suggest that um, you become familiar with uh, Building Standards Commission's webpage. That is generally where we would submit and the official language. Um, I will say that this PowerPoint represents the presentation today. Um, of course, the, the language has been coordinated, but would not be the final submitted language. Um, all of those, all of that text, and I know Mia's, or I believe Mia is still on, um, all of that text would be on Building Standard Commission's website. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Oops, sorry, my wheels on my mouse rolls. Uh, Your mouse is not working. It's uh, actually, I think it's, there we go. I got it. It's very touching. Good job, DSA team. <laughs> Thanks, Enrique. Okay, so without further ado, um, I will introduce again uh, Michelle Golden, who will lead us through carbon reduction. All right. Well, well, thank you for that, Eric. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Michelle Golden. I am a senior architect at DSA on the sustainability team. And I put together today a presentation on carbon reduction. It's um, something that has been in the works for quite a while in the state of California. If you, this slide, you can see that it went back to Brown's administration. Um, he set two targets there. One was to um, lower the levels of greenhouse gas emissions. And we had a set level and a set date that he wanted to achieve that by. And his other one was to achieve statewide carbon neutrality by 2045. Governor Newsom also is working on redoubling those efforts. And he has his executive order in place at this point in California in 1919, and that is to have every state agency basically redouble their efforts to try and mitigate the effects that are currently in place of greenhouse gases and reduce that and still and, and focus on a sustainable economy. So to that end, um, there is a section in the green code. It's section 5.409. It's been there. Um, it's for life cycle assessments. It's been reserved for a while. So our focus now is to put together language to start working towards these goals for carbon reduction. Um, next slide, please. So to that end, we've had several um, workshops. We've got a collaborative group put together, which is not only the state agencies of BSC, DSA and HCD, but we've also got um, other leaders in sustainability, several groups. We've asked uh, professional organizations, the industry professionals, and anyone else that's interested to join us in these collaboratives and, so that we can put together cohesive, relevant uh, code language to, to achieve our ends of reducing greenhouse gas emissions. We have had three already. As you can see there, we had one almost every month. Um, we do have one more, hopefully, that we can get scheduled. Uh, but we certainly would like to have any par 
public participation um, and input that you would care to provide. And we have our DSA address, email address, I believe as well, that you could send us information or comments. Next slide, please. So one of the things um, as I was getting familiar with carbon reduction and working on these collaborative teams is to understand the definitions because there's a whole lot of new definitions that may or may not be familiar. So I tried to go through these and, and bring them out, give them a definition that was easily understood because these are terms that you will see throughout lang the language and in the industry as far as um, our focus on redu reduction of carbon. And some of those are whole building life cycle assessment, which is a cradle to grave analysis of a building's components. Um, a life cycle assessment itself is the service life of a building, which estimated usually around 60 years, I believe, from my research. And it's to determine the values of the design and materials used um, as far as assessing where you are with your um, global warming potential. A couple terms they use are cradle to gate, which means that this is the activities associated with extraction of materials to production of something. For example, the minerals you would need for steel all the way through to producing a steel beam. Uh, also cradle to grave, which is a little bit different, but very similar in some respects. So they're easily um, confused, but this is actually the activities that are associated with its lifestyle from extraction of the materials to make the products through the building and disposal of those products. Um, this is all very new to a lot of people. So if I say something incorrect, somebody jump out there and tell me so that I'm not leading us all down the wrong path. Uh, but we also are concerned about global, global warming potential. You'll see that as we put the regulations together um, mentioned several times, and basically what that is, it's a measure of a given greenhouse gas, and there are various greenhouse gases out there that we are concerned about, but it's relative to an equivalent unit of CO2 over the same time period. Um, so it's something that we try to measure, um, and different gases have different uh, measurements and values. And so to that end, we have environmental product declarations, which summarize how that product impacts the environment. There's three different types to make it easy for everyone. There's industry-wide um, product specific, which is a specific mix and maker over different facilities making it. And then factory specific, which is a single manufacturer in a single facility. So it's, it's all in one place. And then those are actually used in, I think it's a, a level three EPD um, as you go through the codes in the industries that create the software to analyze buildings. And, and that's what those numbers are looking at. Um, the other item that you'll see a lot in the codes and, and in industry um, analysis is this carbon dioxide equivalent which is the measure used to compare the impact of gases based on their global warming potential. Um, so some basic definitions for you. These, we're looking at possibly putting these into our, our code regulations just to help um, standardize what everybody's looking for. But right now we're still in the stages of putting the language together. And so this will at least be a help to anybody that's looking at it. Next slide, please. Um, so one of the other things we're looking at is that we want to be able to report. Michelle, may I interrupt a second? Oh, sure. If that's okay, thank you uh, for the explanation of those definitions. I wanted to just set the stage a little bit on why uh, the state of California is moving towards um, uh, addressing greenhouse gas emissions of products. Um, when we're talking about greenhouse gas emissions, um, it, there's a pie chart that, that addresses um, the, the level of contribution of facilities 
um, or buildings specifically uh, to that greenhouse gas emissions. Um, obviously, transportation is part of it. We're addressing that role with electric vehicle charging. Um, and excuse me if I'm not getting my um, statistics because I'm doing them off the top of my head um, correctly. And I, I stand to be corrected from anyone out there, especially you, Sean, with NBI. I know that you probably have the ability to, to, to actually correct that uh, element. But 40% of the pie chart on greenhouse gas emissions comes from buildings. Um, and so it's a significant amount. And while emissions of the operation of those buildings contribute significantly, a lot of what the California Energy Commission has done through their energy regulatory development in requiring heat pumps um, and in requiring um, energy efficiency uh, addresses a component of that 40%. But we're at that point right now uh, in the world that if we don't start addressing um, how products are manufactured and capturing the, the uh, CO2 or reducing the CO2, finding methods to eliminate how products are developed, um, we're never going to tackle this, this issue of global warming. And so this is a big step forward for the state. It's actually a big step forward for the state nationally to address this in code requirements. Um, and it may seem a little esoteric to some of you and a little bit vague. I, I will like to say that um, when we're talking about the application of uh, where we're going with uh, whole building life cycle analysis or EPDs, this is really just, we're entering just the tip of the iceberg and, and basically dip, dipping our toe in the water and getting feet wet <laughs> well, in tackling this. So, this may seem with a lot of language that's in, it's intimidating, but I do want to start and say that before Michelle goes into this uh, much more uh, in depth, that um, the approach that we're having is, is, is groundbreaking for a building code, but it has been done a lot through um, sustainable programs or you know, environmental programs such as LEED, CHIPS, um, uh, you know, uh, other green, green globes, uh, other programs that are out there have these methods out there. There's software out there that assists with this. It's it's freely available. It, this is really um, a, a bigger responsibility on the design professionals and the materials they specify in their specifications and create and what they need to demonstrate when we're talking about significant cost impacts um, especially for schools, because that's what we're addressing today. Um, what, we're, what we're proposing is aligned with BSC requirements, but um, at, at, when we get to the, the, the scoping part of it, you'll understand that we're, we're really dipping our toe into it and getting everyone kind of acclimated into addressing um, carbon reduction strategies in planning of our buildings, because operationally, or planning and design of our buildings. Operationally, a lot of that um, has been covered by the Energy Commission in energy efficiency, but now we really need to start tackling a little bit more our role in, um, in, in the planning and design of buildings, of products that have demonstrated that they are achieving um, global warming potential reduction targets. And um, so I just wanted to put that out there and so, Michelle, please continue. So, oh, I'll, sure. I'll, sorry, Michelle. I'll <laughs> no, <interview>. go ahead. <laughs> just, just so that we can sort of set the table on what uh, the presentation will cover. Uh, in the EV charging presentation, we had some explicit language um, that was more aligned with what you would see in express terms. What we're going to be presenting today is less specific in terms of, of language and express terms. We would really, we've had a very strong partnership with uh, both BSC, a number of entities, uh, private organizations, et cetera, that have been involved in the Carbon Reduction Collaborative that is part of our um, joint strategic goal with BSC. Uh, and so I would encourage you for that language to join the, the next Carbon Reduction Collaborative, which will have more exquisite language to present. 
So uh, with that, with that being said, go ahead, Nikki. Thank you. Sorry. For oh. Well, thank you. You're both very eloquent at describing something. <laughs> um, anyway, so so part of what we're looking at is is making a, a reporting as part of the regulations. Um, given the fact that it's much easier to assess your buildings and you're already assessing them and analyzing them if you're looking at reducing the carbon footprint of them anyway. Um, and so this basically just lines out some of the things that we would be looking for um, and, and, and things that are specific to that. We would be looking for the um, environmental product declarations, which are already actually put together for a variety of materials. And so those values are already set and they're continuing to be set. Uh, same thing with the um, carbon dioxide limits. Those also have values that are set and we're looking at creating tables with those values that already exist so that you can get a sense of what you're looking at and what you need to achieve. There's already software out there that's available for um, those who want to start analyzing their buildings and the footprints. Um, some of it's free, freeware. It's, um, and I've listed a couple here, Athena Sustainable Materials Institute in One Click LCA. And then you can get paid versions of this, such as Tally for Revit and Sphere, Gabby Solutions, SEMA Pro, and there's others out there, but this also helps you figure out what the um, numbers are for whatever buildings you're designing. And these have been around too for quite a while. So a lot of this has already been established. It's really more of a point of being aware that they're there and being able to access it and use it for your own buildings that you know, you're looking at in designing. Next slide, please. So some of the concepts that we're looking at in the green codes, and again, um, as I said before, we've reserved a section in the green codes. It's been there for a bit. It's just been reserved. Uh, I'm waiting for its turn to be fleshed out and, and put into regulation. Some of the things that we're looking at um, and the language is being worked on, um, but these are the concepts behind the language because that's still in, in flux at this point. So new building re requirements would be a threshold of 50,000 square feet of aggregate building um, to trigger these new requirements of analyzing your building's environmental impacts and you know, the requirements that will be set forth in the green codes. We also looked at additions and alterations for buildings. And again, um, we looked at the fact that if you were altering or adding on to a project with square footage that becomes more than two times the original square footage you started with, then this would also trigger the same type of analysis um, that you would for a new building. Um, we're looking at building, re there's three different areas that we're looking at, building reuse, whole building life cycle assessment, and then the prescriptive approach. Um, and a lot of this is already in the codes to a certain extent, not a great extent, but what we're looking at is looking at what the existing voluntary measures are and creating those and moving some of it into becoming mandatory measures. So they're there, they're not gonna be a big surprise to anyone, um, but we are trying to push it forward so that buildings use these to begin with in design as opposed to making it only a voluntary measure. Um, whole building life, so building reuse is one. Um, whole building life cycle assessments, those we have voluntary measures already within the codes. We're looking at looking at those voluntary measures and moving them to being mandatory measures with a little bit of a different tier. Right now we have tier one and tier two levels and we're looking at revamping those to create different requirements for these two different tiers. The prescriptive approach is to um, exceed these industry-wide environmental product declarations and as a mandatory requirement, and again, reset the voluntary tiers to different percentages and requirements. Next slide, please. 
Um, yeah, uh, Michelle, if I may uh, add sure. a little more context here. Um, so yeah. uh, in working with the, the concept of uh, carbon reduction, the requirement is that if you have a building that's 50,000 square feet or greater, or an addition or alteration to a building that's 50,000 square feet, Feet or greater where the aggregate area is 50,000 square feet. So what I want to clarify with schools is that if you're designing a whole new campus and your, your square footage is 50,000 square feet, this would be applicable. So it's not just only one building, it is even an aggregate of buildings. Uh, it's uh, attributed per project. So whatever the project submitted, if the aggregate square footage um, is 50,000 square feet or greater, that's when this would be triggered. So I just want all of you to think in your mind how often that happens. So when we're talking about a little bit of dipping into um, uh, the carbon reduction strategies, we're starting with a very high threshold of square footage. The concept here is that uh, we want to encourage the reuse of existing buildings. And we know that for our school facilities, that requires for many, building re, many of the building reuse, um, significant seismic upgrades, right? But the point is, is that um, there is a carbon load in demolishing buildings, and then there's an additional carbon load in constructing new. And so the, the greenest building you can have is an existing building, even if you need to improve it, you know, seismically as, as many of our school facilities do. Um, but there are three pathways to address this, meeting this carbon reduction requirement. One is if you use an existing building and you save 45% of the structural elements and 45% of the skin tied to specific elements, you meet this threshold. You don't have to do whole building life cycle assessment. You don't have to do prescriptive approach via the um, environmental product declaration, okay? The other two options, whole building life cycle assessment and the prescriptive approach of um, industry-wide environmental product declaration, um, um, achieving the, the, the limits um, that are set, uh, that's, those are two other options to address this. So depending on your design professional um, and, and their discussions with you, you can choose the method to comply with this. Again, one of them is, especially if it's an alteration of the building, 45% is not a huge threshold. So uh, I, I do wanna uh, clarify the scoping requirements. It's not that you're being required to do all three, it's you're choosing one of the three. There is the only caveat is that if an addition to an existing building is two times more than the original square footage, we would require the new to address either whole building life cycle assessment or prescriptive approach on the new elements. So um, I, I want to I, I wanted to be able to set that and be clear that um, that again this is an introduction to Cal Green carbon reduction uh, requirements. These Michelle's correct. Many of these requirements have been in the voluntary measures which means they've not been triggered unless you wanted to trigger them. And many have used them because if they're achieving uh, lead status or chip status and pursuing those credits, um, they are more aligned with those programs and likely would have achieved tier one or tier two status in the voluntary measures. Um, this is new because we're moving from voluntary to mandatory, but we're moving it uh, in, in, a, in a little bit more easy approach applying it to buildings that are and projects that are larger in size and um, providing options to start addressing uh, carbon reduction, gaining understanding of carbon reduction strategies, and more importantly, really focusing on building reuse as we all should do. Now, obviously we would love that you use your existing built, reuse your existing buildings even less than 50,000 square feet. But I'm saying that in order to uh, for DSA, when you're submitting your projects, we would be looking at one of these three options if you met the minimum scoping requirements. As we advance in further um, additions of the code, obviously we will be looking to lower the threshold and, and increasing requirements. But uh, a lot of what we're doing in uh, stepping forward in um, addressing carbon reduction, which is critical that we, we all do, is also creating an education program that really starts to 
address these measures more holistically for our design professionals that will be in partnership with the American Institute of Architects California. Your design professionals right now, beginning January 1st, 2024, are required to have five units of um, carbon-free training as in order to renew their license. And so we're going to be providing some of that training on our LMS so that they can then trigger this uh, for you. I will say, and I may not get this completely correct, but the, the cost was, I mean, the area was scheduled at, at 50,000 in discussions because it was determined that there was an, a very minimal cost impact to assessing a building for whole building life cycle assessment. And the products that we're addressing here, which is steel, concrete, um, insulation, I think those are the only ones that, uh, if I recall, again, off the top of my head, that are being addressed for environmental product declaration, that the cost impacts for providing those products that meet the limits specified is very small. This is really much more addressing uh, an approach to design initially and getting people used to it as as everything advances and as demand advances, companies are going to be creating products more and more and more. Right now, these are ubiquitous. They're out there. They've been out there for a long time. But when codes demand change and demand demonstration, as codes advance, industry responds. And that's how together we're going to get to a, a, a carbon, a reduction in carbon to address the, the crisis that we face. So I, I wanted to provide a little bit of context on that. And so uh, I will pass it back to you, Michelle. Okay. And you asked me for next slide, so I will give that to you now. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so some of the things we're looking at, um, as Ida was saying, um, those numbers are already out there. And so we are having changes that are coming. I mentioned moving the voluntary codes to more of a mandatory requirement. Um, the tiers will change to some extent, but it's more, we're trying to clarify the approach. And as she said, we've got the three options for you to be able to go through the analysis um, in, to conform with the codes. Um, so other things we're looking at is we're anticipated to include in the language that we have the acceptable maximum global warming limits for you um, for both mandatory and tiered levels. Um, these are already being pulled together. They're based on the published by Clean California Act and the industry-wide environmental product declaration values that are already moving out there. Um, so we will only really look to see that you've included these values on your construction documents uh, because we are hoping, and like she said, you know, as you design these buildings, then you become aware of these values. And so that work is already done to comply with the codes that are coming. It's already done as you design. And so we would just ask that you include those so that we can see you've thought about them um, on your construction documents. But this is all forthcoming um, as the language gets finalized. And I believe um, it's something that's almost at a self-certifying level. And correct me if I'm wrong, Ida or Eric. Um, well, yeah, I guess I should say that um, we we do have a minimal review for Calgary right now. In other words, not an in-depth review. So we will be looking for inclusion of these requirements in the construction documents as specified in, in the code, in the language, um, as well as training our project inspectors into what to look for. Um, uh, you know, at, at, at the close of construction and also supplying some of this information um, so that we can ensure that the products that were specified were actually included. Um, I will say that um, in th th this language, if you're looking for more detail, will be included in greater detail at the September 8th um, Cal Green Carbon Reduction Collaborative meeting. And so uh, that's you're welcome to attend that meeting. The information we'll be sending out information on that meeting early next week. It is September 8th, as well as BSC will be sending that information out, as well as the actual express terms will also be shared. 
And so when you get that meeting notice, you will have the language that's provided there that you can review and we will be discussing it in greater detail um, on September 8th. And for time purposes now, we wanted to introduce the concept and where we're going with this um, because this is new for, for many of you. Uh, be able to answer questions and let you know that more information will be forthcoming. And I, and I think also too, with the language that's being put together, I believe that there are some tables that are being pulled together with kind of a general overview of some of these values and which ones are acceptable. And again, it's all pulled from the current industry standards. Um, so next slide, please. Somebody. Next slide, Paul. Sorry about that. Sorry That's about okay. that. Um, before we move on to um, the CO2 monitoring, um, let's, let's address some comments and questions related to carbon reduction uh, that, that we've had. So I'm gonna skip past this next slide and go to some questions and comments and we'll come back to CO2 monitoring. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, go ahead, Sydney. So, do I understand correctly that uh, for a project that's going to be submitted to DSA next year, say 2023? No, no. Um, July 1st, 2024. Yeah. Work. July 1st, 20. Okay. <laughs> thank, thank you. Yeah. So, again, these, these are changes that are to become effective July 1st, 2024 to the um, 2000, during the 2022 intervening code cycle, so not, you, not the current triennial cycle that will become effective in January. When you get a code book that's actually paper, it's all white. When the intervening provisions are installed, it's the blue pages. And those are oh, okay. 18 months after January 1st, which would be July 1st, 2024. Uh, thank you for the clarification. So let me re revise my comment. Uh, let's say we submit a project for a, a, a whole site rebuild, and that is submitted in August of 2024. Um, we'll be required to submit paperwork showing that we've either done the whole building life cycle or we've met the pre uh, prescriptive requirements as part of our submittal to DSA for or the minimal DSA requirements. Remember, there's three options. So right. if you're saying it's an all-site modernization and it meets the mm -hmm. 50,000 square foot threshold of existing buildings, one way to meet that is to say you've met 45% of the specific items that we've asked you to retain in the building. Then you wouldn't have right. to do the whole building life cycle or the EPD. But, but assuming that we're going to bring a D9 on campus and knock everything down and start from scratch, okay. we would need to then use one of the other two methods. Either the prescriptive approach or the whole building life cycle analysis, yes. Okay. And, and will there, and there will be certain thresholds that we cannot exceed? For global warming potential, yes. Okay. Very good. Thank you. And Sydney, I would say the input that we've received so far Similar to the fifty thousand, the, the high level fifty thousand square foot requirement. These are these are really attainable limits that are going to be listed in the prescriptive approach. We're consistently receiving feedback from nationwide leaders, not just California leaders, both in industry specific products as well as uh, those who are interested in advancing, you know. Uh, stakeholders in the environmental movement as well. So a wide range of feedback and uh, all so far have agreed that they are attainable limits. Yeah, let, let's make sure we get the concrete industry on board for uh, developing more low carbon concrete. And Absolutely. that's what we're working towards. And also <laughs> I wanted to share, Sydney, that we have engaged um, the structural safety team um, and headquarters in our carbon reduction discussions, understanding how, you know, obviously DSA has a higher threshold due to the Field Act of Structural Safety. So they are obviously involved in our discussions to understand, you know, achieving um, uh, higher strengths at less use of uh, concrete product or um, the cement part of it so that we can get greener. Yes. Right. Yeah. And, and actually, what you mentioned earlier, the, uh, project I'm thinking of is on the AB 300 watch list. And so the cost of doing the upgrades 
is bringing us to a, a decision point as to whether to go with a whole site rebuild or a whole site mod. And, and, and so here's another factor to put into the equation. Yes, and we understand that. And, you know, uh, uh, just to, we, we have many objectives that we're working here at DSA. You know, we've been working on an existing buildings task force to really address the costs associated with the, the requirement for the 50% valuation, you know, uh, assessment of full seismic upgrade. Um, there, there have been improvements on that end as well um, that I think are really positive with another work group that we're working on that's stakeholder driven. So um, we have all this in our sites, right? Advancing it together, knowing how one affects the other. Thank you, Sydney. Next, right. raise hand. Next, we have Catherine Hicks. Hi, Catherine. Yeah, I just want to say that um, I'm with an architecture firm uh, working for schools and uh, like to see that this is in the code. We've actually already seen it with some of our local concrete yards, um, you know, raising questions of what is this type of uh, cement we're seeing in, in our concrete mixes. Um, so I think the industry knows it's coming and is already adapting to it. Um, this one specifically, they make all of their own cement. Um, so I think it's, you know, everyone knows it's coming and it'll be, I think how it plays out across the board will be interesting, but that we're already seeing that trend happening, so. Yeah, I would, I would say some of the early input that we, and we've had really positive input from the concrete and cement industry um, and they're eager to participate as well. Some of the some of the issues that they've raised are regional aggregates and cement mixtures and things like that and how to obtain these um, when there's such a wide range of of regional materials that go into any particular concrete mix. So uh, thank you for the words of encouragement. And uh, I will just repeat that, yeah, we, we definitely are, are involved with the concrete and cement industries. Any other raised hands? No more raised hands. Okay. Well then, uh, time check, we are at 3.30. So uh, I know that we have one more agenda item after this. And we also want to make sure we get back to uh, our car carbon monoxide monitoring. So with that, uh, Michelle, I'll hand it back to you. Okay, great. So so currently in the green codes, um, we've done some language for the CO2 monitoring, carbon dioxide monitoring. Um, it's section 5.506. And primarily everything that we have done so far that is now either going to be adopted or is currently adopted has to do with the new buildings that are being built as opposed to existing buildings that are either being altered or added onto. So what we're thinking of proposing um, is that we take this to the next level, so to speak, and we look at the carbon dioxide monitoring for buildings that are going to be either altered or added on to. Uh, and so with that, what I'm showing here, this is the actual um, existing code regulation. And then we have that section 5.506.2 that talks about monitoring in general. And then we have another section 5.506.3 that actually will become, it's been approved, but it doesn't go into effect until January, I believe of next year. And it talks more specifically uh, about CO2 monitoring in the classrooms. So we're looking at taking this first existing regulation about carbon dioxide monitoring and in, including that to, or adding, a section on to include both the alterations, the additions to existing buildings and bringing that regulation for um, CO2 sensors and controls into that into language that will apply to both the additions and the alterations. Um, the next slide that we have is basically showing you what's coming as far as, and next slide please. Uh, so you can just see this is what's effective January 1st, 2023. Um, and so we're looking at this as well with an eye to including that with any, some future regulatory language that would again address building additions and alterations. But we'd like your input. So what do you think? 
Um, and I'd just like to add that a lot, of, thank you, Michelle, um, a lot of the improvements that the Energy Commission has already required um, that will be effective January 1st really does require um, uh, more prolifically, I should say, um, demand control, ventilation, um, economizers on systems. So many uh, additions and ultra, uh, well, for new construction, generally it will likely be provided anyways. For additions and alterations, we're really trying to capture some of those additions and alterations that don't address HVAC equipment and, and trying to uh, provide just the monitor so that we can um, really uh, keep an eye on the indoor air quality that's so important for our kids to learn. Um, and so I, I wanted to share a little bit of the why, the statement of reasons that we're required to provide where we're going to bring um, additions and um, alterations into the requirement for carbon dioxide monitoring. Go ahead, Michelle. So, and, and just to clarify, this is language again that's going to be in, or that will become effective in January 2023 uh, for, for new buildings. We are proposing to move those into alterations as well, to include alterations for the intervening code cycle that will become effective July of 2024. So it is a bit of a moving target. We understand and recognize that. Um, so we appreciate your interest in, in receiving this potentially this early. So uh, let's, are there raised hands on this? There are no raised hands. Okay. Well, uh, so in the interest of time, we have about 25 minutes and I know there was a number of uh, interested parties interested in uh, all gender facilities. So while that is not specifically in Cal Green, we'll, we'll go ahead and address it here because it is important to our schools. Uh, so uh, that, that we'll shift gears from, from Cal Green Part 11 and move into the California Plumbing Code um, Part 5, uh, but specifically multi-user all gender restroom facilities. Um, so some of the things that have occurred so far uh, in, in our in our processes is that we we have partnered with a number of agencies, CBE, AIA, um, CAE, uh, all of the via Building Standards Commission. Of course, uh, we, we consistently work closely with them, uh, and, and to that end, we we have held a, a joint workshop with uh, DSC and DSA, and we held that on July 19th. And then pr prior to that, there was a, as I mentioned, a larger meeting with CDE uh, on April 6th. Uh, all, all of these are targeting um, what is increasingly becoming clear in, in the interest to include um, all of our constituencies across the state, uh, regardless of gender. Uh, and so to that end, um, there has been um, some proposed legislation that is uh, potentially going to become effective. Uh, and currently SB 1194 uh, by Allen would, would allow local jurisdictions to permit all gender multi-use facilities until such a time that the Building Standards Commission uh, passed regulations that, that also allow for that. So up, up on the first bullet point, you'll just notice that currently in the California Plumbing Code, which, which our model code for that is the UPC, Uniform Plumbing Code, currently requires separate facilities and that the total fit, tabulated fixture counts are 50% male and 50% female. And so there, there is no explicit allowance for multi-user all gender facilities. There, there are uh, allowances for single use all gender facilities uh, and most likely you're familiar with those. Um, while we're not gonna touch on um, in depth uh, on accessibility, some of the, the issues that, that we will need to address with regards to the allowance for an all gender multi-user facility, bathroom facility is, is embedded in accessibility. And so we're going to be working closely with our um, access code collaborative 
in separate workshops to address some of the changes that would need to be uh, incorporated in concert with changes for the allowance for all gender multi-user uh, restroom facilities. Some of those are privacy compartments. So um, dependent upon what the specific language that becomes adopted in the California Plumbing Code, um, if th those compartments may, be, may need to become larger. Now, those are requirements that already exist in 11B, so it's not that large of an issue, but just the acknowledgement that those compartments, if they go floor to ceiling, would need to be larger. Um, one thing that is not in 11B, again, we'll talk more specifically about these in, in access workshops, but urinal compartments currently are not uh, a, a standard within um, Chapter 11B. Uh, there's the potential for additional signage requirements. As you may know that in Chapter uh, or in the building code, there, there are no specific requirements for signage, but you can imagine uh, in an all gender facility when you're faced with uh, many doors, it, it might be appropriate to uh, include some signage requirements and scoping. Uh, and then, of course, security is a, another key issue that will be addressed probably more specifically in the plumbing, plumbing code um, uh, language that, that becomes adopted. So as I mentioned, um, the current plumbing code, California plumbing code, does not allow for it. It's, it's pro prohibitionary to uh, all gender uh, multi-user facilities. <clears throat> and so some of the changes we would be including in the language is an allowance for that, not, not a requirement, but an allowance for uh, a facility to include all gender facilities as opposed to the prohibition that's currently there. Um, it, it would need to address tabulated total combined fix, uh, fixture counts that, that include the occupancy for all genders. The, the current tables, uh, of course, identify specific requirements for male and specific requirements for female genders. Uh, the total would need to be uh, under consideration and included in um, a facility improvement or a new building. As I mentioned, uh, SB 1194, once uh, as it's written currently, um, would would be repealed after the adoption of regulation. Uh, and then, of course, some of the changes, as I mentioned uh, in the previous slide, we would need to, in concert with the plumbing code changes, need to update uh, requirements in 11B. And then security, I will say that there, there are a number of issues that I'm sure folks are, are interested in. Security, of course, is one of them. And in large part, that's a design response, right? How, how security is provided, whether it's visual, audible, um, or, or just simply oversight. Um, those are all issues that would need to be addressed through a design response. And I, I can say that there are a number of really good design responses that, that I have seen and that have Im been implemented. Um, so that, that's um, not something that would be completely embedded within changes that are being addressed in the plumbing code. Um, of course, the CPC and building code overall are minimum standards. Uh, that, that attempt to allow designers to create spaces such as this with, with the most options. Um, so that, that is a really brief um, description, but I would like to give, uh, I believe Kevin Day is on the line. I'd like to give a moment to Kevin Day before we go to question and answers and uh, see if he has anything he would like to a uh, Kevin Day is responsible for managing this process through Building Standards Commission. Thanks, Eric, and hi, everybody. Um, yeah, you you pretty much kind of summarized our, our July workshop nicely and some of the, the issues that, that we're co-adopting here for this all-gender proposal. Um, just, just, you know, some things I'd like to kind of add. Um, while we're, co we're considering a, a co-adopted proposal with similar language, um, as the DSA folks have stated today, their uh, their regulations would be applicable to K through 12 public schools, community colleges, and um, essential services buildings, whereas BSCs would apply to um, certain elements of state buildings, state colleges, and universities. So that's a distinction that we uh, explained at the last workshop. Um, 
And also, yeah, we're just uh, looking for some feedback from folks and um, we'll be developing these proposals uh, and, and really appreciate any information that you can provide. Thank you. And so Kevin, um, I believe you had mentioned um, that we would be emailing out to our stakeholders yeah. all of the specific language. Yes, thank you, Eric. That's our intent and that's what we explained last month. Thanks for reminding me. So after any comments we, we hear today and, and comments that we've already received, uh, BSC and DSA will, will continue to work on our proposal that we hope to um, email to our respective stakeholder lists in the coming weeks as we kind of round out the pre-cycle phase of this 2022 intervening cycle. Um, and at that juncture, we'll, uh, we'll be sharing uh, our draft express terms language and some, you know, most likely some, some rationale, you know, uh, some background information on the proposals. Um, again, soliciting feedback um, to the regulated community, you know, if the language is workable, you know, we'll be factoring in comments we received about uh, terminology um, and, uh, you know, just some of the other issues. Um, also, any, any economic or fiscal impacts that any of the stakeholders can identify um, once the language is shared. Um, so again, we hope to do that in the coming weeks. And if you haven't already done so, um, yeah, please sign up for the, the Building Standards Commission and the division, the state, state architects, uh, respective mailing list, so you can get notification or receive that that uh, language. Um, but yeah, we'll, we're hoping to send that out in the next uh, in the next few weeks. Thanks, Eric. Thank you, Kevin. So I'm not seeing any raised hands, um, but would welcome those questions. For those, go ahead. Well, a couple questions uh, from the July workshop. Uh, it was raised this question that we need uh, these codes earlier than 2024. Is there any consideration given to have some revisions published, some pointers to new uh, state uh, regulations that are coming to get some uh, information or direction to have sooner than 2024, January 2024. And the other comment I have is regarding locker rooms, which are not covered in California plumbing code. So has any consideration given to all gender locker rooms? So uh, for those, uh, thank you for your question. I will say that uh, for schools, if DSA does permit this, we considered it an alternate means. And so we have approved all gender facilities, even though the plumbing code doesn't allow it. Um, I will, uh, because they're even at the local jurisdiction, if you were applying it to a non-school project to the local jurisdiction, you could request alternate means until the laws pass. We do have, there's a bill in the legislature right now that looks likely that it will be signed, but of course we're at the end of the legislative session and we'll know for sure by the end of October if it's signed, which would state that um, as of January 1st, 2024, that it is permissive um, um, to, uh, you know, to have the all gender facilities. So stat state law supersedes building code and the jurisdictional entities would be informed that, that it could be permitted. So um, it, it is a process versus, you know, statute versus building code. This will be in effect July 1st, 2024, if it is adopted by the Building Standards Commission. Until that time, there's always the alternate means process. And then, of course, the legislative process is in play that, that it creates a statutory requirement that it, it, can, that it can occur. So there, there's other methods in place before January 2024 that you can address that. Um, but we're, you know, some, oftentimes the regulatory process is really kind of to, to facilitate it moving forward without these uh, means for all, these requests for alternate means. I don't know if you have something else to add to that, Kevin. Uh, no, I was going to bring up the legislation as well, because like you said, that'll, if that is signed, it would allow jurisdictions to adopt an ordinance to basically do what what be it, something very similar to what BSC and DSA are proposing for the 2022 intervening code supplement. And that would be effective and operative January 1st, 2023, a year and a half before our regs would be effective um, and agree on the, the using alternate means and methods comment. Um, as far as the, the locker rooms comment uh, for those, like we talked about last month, I think the scope of BSC and DSA's uh, amendments uh you know would be limited to and this is something that we're going to have to continue to look at in the development of the regulations but it's specific to you know a, an all-gender multi-user restroom 
whereas a locker room I think it encompasses a little bit more so you know we're not sure if it would apply there that might be something that needs to be investigated and further studied you know in a future cycle um uh possibly you know we talked about uh coordinating with the department of public health because there's the element of um of multi-user restrooms attached to a public pool which they have authority for so those are things i think we're going to look at down the road but but for now i think we're trying to limit the scope to like a typical multi-user restroom for the all gender uh, purposes and I think what's important to clarify too is that there is still a question that is it the dressing locker part and the showering part or is it the restroom part right like maybe the, it applies to the restroom part but not necessarily the showering dressing part so um, that still also less Kevin says needs to be flushed out wait that was I guess a poor reference <laughs> when we're talking about restroom uh, yes uh, you know, uh, discuss. That was kind of an inadvertent, but it does need to be um, addressed more thoroughly. It has not at this point, you know, been addressed specifically for bathrooms related to locker room facilities. Or sorry, restrooms related to locker room facilities, because ours relate to restrooms, not bathing rooms. Thank you very much. Okay, next up we have Matthew Spiegelman. Hello, um, my question may be a little bit off topic, but I'm not seeing any other hands raised. I'm wondering what current requirements uh, for gray water use at schools are, and if anybody at the DSA or plumbing would know that. Um, we don't have, uh, uh, if you're looking at Cal Green, we actually don't uh, dropped any of the water reuse requirements. Um, if the local um, uh, water delivery system includes purple pipe, right, like recycled gray water, then you can use it because it's contained and it's applied to specific purposes. Um, when we're talking about uh, recycled rainwater that's, that's manipulated on site, you would need to meet with DSA so that we can ensure that, you know, how that's implemented outside of like a purple pipe system, right? Like if you're doing rainwater capture in a cistern and then distributing it, we would need to know to see if there's any concerns uh, for that. I would just say meet with us and have those discussions. So it's not prohibited. We just don't have regulatory requirements for it. And we we want to make sure, you know, that that they're that we're considering the structural safety aspects of any delivery system also you know that there's there's an adequate separation um we wouldn't want kids drinking something that's non potable so does that are there sense? any plan yes it does thank you are there any plans to implement mandates regarding water recycling we will be looking at it we have as you can see a very uh large effort right now going on for an intervening code cycle with limited staff and so we do have a list of items that we want to discuss but obviously you could see something like that really involves another work groups with our schools to really understand what methods of, of delivery and that's out there um, and then also the requirement to to say this is required for your project right so there's there's the option of what's permissive and then what's required and and so that's that's that discussion because there's many different ways to do it not every community has the purple pipe option so uh, it was going to be my point is that uh, an allowance for that um, needs to be included um, if if available um, regionally. Yeah, but we don't. We, you know, if if you're tying into the system, it's not. We we don't say no. You can't use um, recycled water that's delivered municipally. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew. Are there any other raised hands? Currently, no other raised hands. Oh, wait, Marcos Rodriguez. Uh, yes, this is correct. The question is for Ida. Ida, you had talked during the carbon sequestration portion of this meeting here. Um, you talked about, did you mention the word injection? As far as a, a, a way of deviating um, from the building or, or something to that effect? So uh, I don't recall in any context that I used injection because that's not part of the regulatory requirement. So either I may have misspoken or 
that part's not part of the right. And so maybe if you have a question specific to context, but we don't we don't address anything injection when it comes to carbon. Okay. Um, as, as you know already, as, as a tree advocate, I know there's uh, on landscapes on our respective campuses. Uh, will any credit be given for carbon sequestration if we can demonstrate that the trees that we have on inventories on our respective campuses would, would be counted in that calculation as well? No, because we're trying to reduce the impact that buildings have on the environment. Shade trees are required. We know that they provide a benefit um, and we have shade tree requirements in our code, but this is really a collective effort to address that 40% of building impacts. And so we're not looking to say, you know, choose products because a lot of the products that are emitted are actually emitted off the campus site so that the trees don't necessarily absorb that uh, product. This is really uh, advancing the design and understanding collectively of the building industry to uh, address carbon from a building products perspective um, and, and, and designing buildings with that framework in mind. Yeah, I appreciate the clarification there. Thank you. Thank you, Marcus. Well, looks like Sydney, you have your hand up again. Uh, yeah, I was uh, interested in the uh, CRCC workshop on September 8th. Uh, where would I look to find a, a link to attend? Do you want to go forward or do you want me to? Yeah, so uh, <laughs> that actually is a really good transition, Sydney. Uh, I'll, I'll cover that in a slide if, if you don't mind. So I think uh, in the interest of time, we've got about six minutes. So uh, I will, uh, let me sorry, minimize something so I can see the slides. So I just want to go back um, and, and cover our next step. So um, we are early in the pre-cycle or sorry, two thirds of the way through our pre-cycle uh, and um, our, we will be submitting uh, proposals to DGS Finance BSC um, and actually earlier than December, but they're due to BSC uh, in December uh, of this year. Uh, and subsequent to that, um, that, that we will start to receive, so after that, we will start to receive comments again in the 45 day period and 15 day periods, but there are other workshops that you can attend uh, through the Building Standards Commission um, and their uh, code advisory committees. Uh, so uh, to your question, uh, there there is a, I say tentatively, I, I'm pretty sure it's in ink, it just hasn't been published yet, but there is going to be a uh, upcoming workshop hosted by the Building Standards Commission, which you can, um, you, you if you're signed up for their listserv, you'll receive an invite to that and a notification of that. If you're signed up for our rulemaking, you will receive an invite to that. It has not been posted yet, but we do anticipate um, Building Standards Commission posting that um, next week. So you can look for it uh, either through your email um, or online uh, through the Building Standards Commission's webpage. And again, this is a slide of all of the efforts Building Standards Commission is hosting, um, but they, they are the primary agency that is hosting this. And it, it'll be a public workshop available on YouTube, et cetera, uh, as all of their uh, workshops are, um, but we will also notify it. So in a nutshell, as you received information about this outreach, I assume you received it out from BSA directly. That, that means you are on our listserv. And so you will receive the BSC notice as well because we will notify everyone on our listserv about BSC's notices. You can go on BSC's website and also sign up for their listserv. But I do want to let you know that we will be sending that information. And if you got this meeting's announcement directly to you, in other words, it wasn't forwarded to you by somebody else, um, you will receive that notice as well. Does that help? Thank you very much. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, these are live links um, to, uh, as you'll receive the web. If you download this presentation from our website once posted, uh, you can use this to get to those uh, sites as well. Um, and as Ida mentioned, if, if you receive this notification, then you're already on our search. If you received it um, via, uh, you know, a peer, then please do go to our website. At the very bottom, uh, you, you'll see in the upper right-hand corner of this slide, I've circled the 
the way to subscribe. Simply hit the su subscribe button now um, on at the bottom of our website, and uh, you you will be added to a number of or have the option of being added to various key topics that might interest you. So select any number of those that are available to you through that through that link, and we will um, it, you, you will automatically be added to that to that listserv name. Um, and I'd also mention that um, we do have our sustainability for California schools, uh, and you can receive information via our website on that as well. Um, so with that, we are a whole two minutes early. And from everybody at DSA Headquarters Sustainability to you, we really thank you for attending. As I mentioned, this is overwhelming attendance at one of our rulemaking workshops. So, and, and honestly, we were very impressed and excited with the number of folks who responded to our survey as well. Very valuable information and want to continue to encourage you to um, stay involved with DSA. We, we really do desire to have um, our stakeholders input as we progress through rulemaking. Thank you. Thanks so much, Ida, Eric, Paul, Michelle, everybody. Appreciate it. Thank you.